Chico and the Man will not be presented this evening, and the Rockford Files will be seen one hour later than normal, so that we may bring you the following special program. Word Balloon is... Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here. Always happy to welcome Tom Fowler, sensualist, back to Word Balloon. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, good to see you, too, John. How are you? Doing all right, man. Doing okay. I'm uh, I'm in between conventions. I was at uh, um, Terrificon in Connecticut last weekend and saw a bunch of our friends. And this mm -hmm. weekend is the, the Chicago show, uh, C2E2. So, okay. And uh, you're, you're masking up, are you? Um, yes, yes, it's in Chicago, <laughs> and uh, that's fine. And I'm boosted and everything, so so far, so good. good. Uh, nothing happening. Ah, Will Plight in uh, welcoming us and saying good to see uh, both of us. Thank you, Will. Pleasure that you're joining us today. Thank you. Um, certainly, if people have questions or comments they want to make, uh, you're welcome to do so. And uh, Just questions, no comments. I, I know what I look like. <laughs> you know, I know what this place looks like. I don't. I don't need your comments. I understand, man. No, it's uh, you know, as as I've said before, you and you and Mike Norton, uh, you know, it's uh, it's easy to mistake one for the other, and uh, and again, you're well, you're very well kept. Uh, well, one of us is handsome. I respect that. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. <laughs> um, hey, man, what are you what are you working on these days? What's going on? Uh, well, I just finished uh, a well, I didn't just finish it, but um, I finished. A, a while back um working on the follow-up to stand by uh, zooming in oh, oh, oh. sucking <laughs> in my gut uh yeah. the follow-up to basket full of heads which is refrigerator nice. full of heads um and the cool. uh uh the foc or etc cetera, etc cetera, is like the 19th or the 21st or the Eighth, depending on who you're talking to, um, but uh, which is why I'm here. We're we're parting the kimono. We're parting the kimono. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, no. Uh, 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 it was uh, written by Rio Ewers, um, colored by Bill Crabtree. Um, I'm forgetting the letterer's name. It was Devin something. Uh, <laughs> I'm a bad, I'm a bad man. Uh, and uh, my, my buddy Craig Talfer helped me out with a couple of the issues uh, when I um, needed it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been a, um, it was, it was, it was, it's a, a good, gory, bloody, funny um, uh, comic, uh, horror comic. Um, about axes and various other weapons and decapitated heads and refrigerators and sharks. Um, from the cover, adapted from a Joe Hill novel, I'm assuming? 
No, uh, Joe um, uh, Joe curated. It's part of the Hill House line. So Understood. New, wow, uh, great. So he's he wrote Basketful and Rio wrote um, Refrigerator, but you know Joe was in every email, every story conversation, and cool. uh, so he curates. It's because it's Hill House. He curates the whole line. So I think that's um, great. Man. So tell me about working with uh, with Joe. How is that? I haven't I haven't had him on yet. Oh no, it was great. It was it was really nice. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't do any of the, oh, you know, you know, I I don't I don't know that anybody wants to be known for being the son of a famous dad kind of thing, you know. Like so, sure. um, I didn't do that. The only time I I brought it up was after I'd signed all the paperwork and we were starting to work together. Um, I I should do it. Like you know, I I don't want to do it. this. Is the only time I'm going to do it, but uh, my. <laughs> My, I was, I was at my parents' place the other night, and I told them about this book, and they told me about how they'd run into your dad uh, at a, a B and B in New England somewhere, and uh, uh, and their their takeaway was, well, he was a pleasant chap. Yeah. <laughs> no, I hear it. No, that was about it. They had a like nice long conversation about tombstones or something like that with him. I don't know. Probably, my mother's <laughs> probably bending his ear about genealogy. Um, and he would know about you know uh, New England, so yeah, uh, yeah, it was basically that. But otherwise, no. Joe Joe's been great. He's uh, he would always kind of he a, a lot of what he would do was kind of come in and um uh, do a little bit of punch up here and there. Um, but the process being the process, and me being me, uh, as I insinuate myself into the process, we all did punch up, um, sure. and sure. Uh, you know that's how that's how books should get made uh, as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. Absolutely, so it was a lot of just kind of sweetening jokes and sweetening horror moments and, and um, just kind of getting a final go ahead to say like, this is okay, or this is too much or, you know, whatever. Uh, my main, the, the quote that I am the most excited about for the, the trade or not the trade, but the hardcover when it comes out in October is uh, I think it was issue number four. Four, um, we got uh, a note back from somebody in standards um, saying, that's, well, I, I got to hand it to you. That's the grossest thing I've ever seen in a North American comic book. And I was like, because that's, I mean, that's what you're going for with this. This is the bloodiest book I've ever worked on. That's great. Um, and yeah. it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was a blast. And we wound up putting that on the cover. Um, <laughs> Outstanding. But, uh, is, is, is Hill House through Image? Uh, who's who's? No, it's DC. Wow, I had no idea. That's great. Interesting. Yeah, I think this might be one of the last books from Hill House. I'm not really sure, but they um, they did a number of books uh, for uh, a couple of years. I think. I don't. I'm so out of touch with what's actually happening in publishing that, like, I no, I, I know what's. I know it's. I know what I'm working on, uh, and that's about it. I think the only books I buy anymore are artist editions. So, <laughs> so. Um, oh, this is interesting. Doubt wants to know: Was there any censorship for baskets after the whole bat penis situation at Black Label? Yeah, Batman. Damn. No. Good. Good. <laughs> I'm not aware of any bat penis. So, I what what penis happened? Um, Azzarello and Lee Bermejo did a Batman horror thing for Black Label, their new adult line that yeah, had yeah, yeah. DC Universe, you know, characters. And mm. yeah, there was this shot of Batman naked, and there's the bat unit. Right. And, did uh, it look like a bat? Uh, it did not. It did not have wings. Well, then it's uh, not. It's then it's not accurate. It's not. I hear not you, canon. man. But it Batman's. Really, Batman's penis looks his foreskin kind of flops to the side like bat wings. Ew. I um, understand. Of course. That's why he's so angry. People You're damn think, right. People think it's his parents, but it's not. It's this. It's the bad penis. I understand. Yeah. No, and it really, I mean, uh, yeah, it was quite the controversy. The people upstairs were not happy that uh, Batman's unit was uh, out there. And I don't know. I mean, speaking speaking as somebody who put a whole bunch of penises into like regular DC, uh, I whatever. <laughs> like, 
I mean, they all got, I, they, they were, they were meant to get pixelized, but um, I, I drew them anyway. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's there. I mean, like I, if it was going to get pixelized, it should at least get like pixelized accurately. Um, but that was largely a response to the scene being like a bunch of naked ladies. And I was like, eh, nah. No, There'll be I, naked ladies with stuff covering their 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 stuff, but that that hog's going to be out there. There you go. That's cool. Sure. Well, that's cool though. So basket baskets of heads. No, um, that wasn't in basket of heads. That was that was years no. ago. That was in caper. Oh no, I realize there are I no that. <laughs> I was going to say the only hogs. In, the only yeah, the only hogs in 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 refrigerator are 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 motorcycles. All right, fair enough. No, all I was going to say is yeah, everyone, and I'm sure I'll mention it later. That uh, basket of heads is uh, coming out in October. That's fantastic. Penis uh, free. Penis free. You heard That's it here. Tom Fowler guarantee. <laughs> Have you gotten back, you and uh, Parker, uh, Mysterious? Was it Mysterious, uh, your magician, Wild Star? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we've talked about it. Uh, I uh, have not been in a place in the last you know, since the pandemic, since before the pandemic started that I could really do, uh, do much. And whether that's because I got bogged down with work or whether that's because I got bogged down with other stuff, um, we could pursue with it. You frozen. Uh, we're still broadcasting. I'll keep talking. Uh, we are. We, uh, we are. You're okay. Uh, all right. Uh, you, you froze like this. And I understand. It was, yeah. It was awesome. No, I understand. Um, um, the cloud is taking care of us, so don't worry. If we freeze <laughs> uh, between each other, it's still recording properly in the cloud. Yeah. No. We we we've talked about doing various things in various different formats, and we we um, Jeff has written the first part of a return um, that I will get to at some exactly. point uh and yeah. we we we've collaborated on scripts for doing something with in a different format um and that could still happen it's just neither of us know enough about that other <laughs> format to make it uh for us to really pursue it right i'm um with everything else going on on in 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 my life and uh with various you know, we've talked about mental health stuff on here before. So I, I will just say with my own mental health and with, you know, with, uh, I, I just recently got diagnosed with ADHD as has everyone else, apparently. Uh, in, in my their friend, I, I, and, uh, I have it as well. I haven't been diagnosed, yeah. but, um, uh, Rick, Rick Gregg, uh, prisoners of gravity or Rick green, rather Rick green. Yeah. Yeah. Rick green. Rick green I had yeah. him on the show and, you know, he's an advocate of awareness for ADHD and yeah. that's really what's occupying a lot of his time. And in the conversation, he's like, you know, I've got an online test, a YouTube thing. He goes, try it. And sure yeah. enough, it's like, oh, I absolutely have it. And I'm sure. Oh, I no, did. yeah. It's, and so. it's, I mean, it's, it's a broad diagnosis. And that's why you need to, like, actually um, talk to a doctor. You know, if you have the means, pay an actual person to take you through the system kind of thing. But, you know, there are enough. Uh, um, there are enough uh, information sources online that you can kind of broadly speaking say, well, that seems familiar. And that's kind of what happened with me. Like my, yeah. um, my kid got diagnosed uh, several years ago. Okay. And um, while he was going through the testing and while I was reading over, you know, the things that he was doing, I was like recognizing things from it, from my own childhood and fr and, and moving forward. Um, and then finally I got enough steam under me because <laughs> again, I was too ADHD to get tested for ADHD, you know? Um, yeah, so once I, I actually got enough steam under me and, and went and did it, uh, it, it really did change things because I started to rec recognize things that I didn't realize were part of it that I'd been kind of carrying around like an albatross around my neck thinking, Oh, I'm a bad, I'm a bad person because I can't finish these things, or I'm a bad person because I've ghosted things, or I'm a bad person because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that, or I, you know, this made me feel this way or that made me feel that way, kind of thing. And um, so, you know, the the recovery for from it is, or the the 
dealing with it is, you know, kind of multifaceted. So there's, you know, number one, there's just going on the drugs. Uh, and I'm on, the, I'm on the same stuff as my kid, okay. um, which is basically just slow dose Dexedrine, you know. Okay. Um, and uh, it, all, that, all that really does is it helps me focus um, in a way that I wasn't able to focus before. And I always kind of describe it as, um, you know, you, you've got, uh, what's it called, uh, the, uh, um, analysis paralysis. So, you know, you see a thousand different, you know, options on, you know, on the screen in front of you kind of thing. And they all just kind of jam. You can't get them all through. But the way I always kind of describe it is that uh, for me, I would, you know, I would, I would look at a drawing and I'd be like, do I need to do this line or do I need to do this line? Um, and, you know, the drawing is going to fail if I do the wrong line. At the same time, I'm worrying that if this book sucks, I'm going to lose my house, right? But because of the ADHD, all of those anxieties are on the same level, right? Let me actually level my hands. Uh, all, all, of, all, all of those all those things are on the same level, right? Yeah. Um, and what the drugs really did was they helped me to kind of compartmentalize them right. so that I could put the one... I'm going to do it in the right way. Um, so, like the house, the house losing thing is over here. The line thing, because because they were on the same level, they would intertwine, and it would become if I do this line instead of this line, I'm going to lose my house. I get it, buddy. Right, yeah. like that. Yeah. That that was that was what was going on in my head, and that's what goes in. So understand goes on the head in a lot of people's heads, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. And, and that was, you know, that was the, the way I kind of illustrate it. So basically all the drugs really do is help me focus to separate them. And, 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 and so I can, I can deal with line A or line D and then I can deal with, you know, whatever other anxieties that are more or less important or just uh, the creation of an overactive imagination. And that's the problem when you're creative and you have ADHD, um, because the, the that whole kind of like everybody hates me because I'm doing it wrong <laughs> thing. Um, you can come up with some really, really horrible scenarios in your head for yeah. how you're screwing up and what that's, you know, what other people think of you as a result kind of thing. Oh, so, yeah. I, you know, I've been dealing with that and, and uh, um, you know, my uh, stuff with my family that I'm not going to talk about. And, and and the pandemic and the incredible kind of toxic selfishness that came along with the pandemic uh, as well, yeah one of the other things i've discovered is 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 uh being uh uh, uh having a hyper intolerance to unfairness uh, so like you want like i which i recognized in my kid he was like who very much kind of like justice you know sure. um and you know seeing people like balk masks and vaccines and you know the horrible people in the world like telling you ah you don't need that stuff and you know um yeah. it it's it's been maddening and it's it's just you know i've, I've just been uh, you know my my soul is just cotton or is just steel wool at this stage so i i you know i'm coming out of that it just makes you know, I'm trying not to promise myself or other people too much um, because I keep over promising and not, you know, whatever. So I've got I've, I've actually got a secret project that we can talk about again in, in the fall um, Great. if you want, because that's when we're that's when we're announcing it. Um, okay. But I, I mean, I can say it's with my buddy Fred uh, and it's yeah, very I on brand. It's very it's very on brand for both of us. Yeah, um, that's 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 just that's. Just, that's Fred Van Lente. Sorry, you heard say something and I heard a Fred Fred Van Lente? Yeah, yeah. Great. So so yeah, so um we're I'm I'm uh, about mm, I want to say about a third of the way through. Uh he's uh most of the way through the script. Uh and we're probably we're probably going to kickstart it um, so long okay. as, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, 
that's the plan right now. I'm hoping they don't go through with any blockchain stuff because then I'll feel, you know, um, but, uh, we're, we're doing, I'm doing my best to, to get it, to get myself moving on it. Sure. Um, and because, because it's a self, you know, we own it and it's a self, uh, uh, what, what, yeah, self-published self, uh, motivated project. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I, I have to find other ways to, uh, pay the mortgage uh and get through it. but it's 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 actually i've gotten back on it um and i'm i'm very much enjoying uh what i'm doing it's it's a it's very different from anything i've done before so it's uh it's a lot of it's a lot of work no, <laughs> um, but great. it's it's good work so yeah and is it are you finding that the medication is helping you focus yeah and and, and yeah, yeah. Be more productive and everything yeah uh a lot it, it's it's got its um you have to kind of keep on keep a, a a lid on anxiety and i've got to um I'm, i need to get into better shape because it, it will i'm i'm in my late 40s now and my blood pressure is not necessarily where it needs to be and the drugs don't help you know uh suffice to say even a little bit of dexedrine every day does not do wonders for your blood pressure okay. um okay. so you know stuff like that so i'm I, i'm 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 learning as i go but it's so far it's 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 been a big help uh i remember well, actually just literally the day after i went on the stuff uh it's called vivance by the way and just just before anybody asks okay. um well, I know. Like anytime any of us start talking about mental health on online or like what we do or what we do, you, you wind up, uh, uh, you know, you'll wind up getting DMs from people saying like, "What do you want? What's your do? <laughs> like, what's your what's your diet? You know, like what's, yes. what's your dosage? Yeah. Um, no, but it's I'm I'm on a very, very a fairly low dosage of vitamins. But okay. um, what I what I discovered when I first went on it was um, that I, I, all of a sudden, like it was crazy. It was like that that all of a sudden I was like, holy shit, is this what you motherfuckers have felt like all this time? I've been missing out on feeling like this, like a complete human being for 48 fucking years. I hear this you. is how you feel yeah. all the time yeah. for free? You know, so that was, That's you funny. know, and I, I've, I've kind of come down from that. I don't know if you've ever been on, it was a bit like when I first started taking it, it was a bit like, I don't know if you've ever been on progesterone. No. Uh, which oh, is, it's, it's a, it's a steroid that they give you for like, um, if you have like a severe asthma attack or a severe allergic reaction, or uh, if they need to stimulate your system in cancer treatments and stuff like that. Like I remember my mom was on it for a while when she was going through all of her cancer stuff years ago. Okay. Um, but uh, I was on it. We uh, we we uh, had a holiday in St. Lucia uh, a number of years ago, and I got stung by a jellyfish. Oh, Jesus. And uh, yeah. Um, and then I had uh, an extreme allergic reaction to that, which caused an asthma attack. But as of yet, I had not yet been diagnosed with asthma. I had no idea. I just got short, short of breath sometimes. So I didn't know what it was. So I had an anxiety attack, which felt like a heart attack, which caused a greater anxiety attack because I thought I was dying, I... which almost gave me a heart attack. Jeez. And I had to go to a hospital in St. Lucia. <laughs> Wow, and the, the, the and they were just like you're you're dehydrated. Drink this, <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. sure. Um, wow. And uh, but it was, I mean, whatever. It, it it all worked out. But I wound up having to go to the Caribbean equivalent of a Costco to uh, <laughs> fill my prescription. Um, so while I'm waiting for my prescription, because the resort wouldn't do it, and okay. while, <laughs> while I'm. Yeah, so I had to walk down a highway to a Costco, basically. Jesus. I can't remember what it's called, but it was basically a Costco. So okay. while I was there, I wandered around, bought four bottles of whiskey for 20, uh, no, four bottles of rum for 20 bucks, <laughs> uh, picked up my, picked up my, my <laughs> Ziploc bag of pills and uh, uh, went back. And the thing with progesterone is, uh, well, it, we were only there for a few more days, and uh, my wife, uh, we flew back into Toronto 
uh, we flew out from Toronto and we were going to drive back and, you know, and uh, we were just driving back and forth uh, between Ottawa. My wife had a a doctor's appointment, so she had to fly from Toronto straight to Ottawa. And I just went back to the hotel where we'd left the car and drove back. But by this point, so I spent the night and then I drove back the next morning. But at this point, I was five days into being on steroids. Um, And the difference is when I was on Vivant, like now, uh, like when I first started taking the Vivants, I felt like I could jump over an elephant. Do you know what I mean? Like I was so like, you know, like it was just, I like, let's go like that first, those first couple of days were so hyper organized. I was, and I got to go get a winter coat and I'm going to go get some flagstones and I'm going to go, you know, I was just like down to like 15 minute mark. I was just like, I got it. I got it. I'm going to weed the garden. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I did it all. Right. Uh, when I was driving home on progestion, like when you're on progestion, you feel like you can jump through an elephant. Uh, <laughs> And that was the closest, you know, that was the closest I could feel. So I'm like driving five hours uh, <laughs> between the five hours between Ottawa and, Tor- and Toronto yeah. and uh, stopped at my folks place and I'm just buzzing, you know? Um, so yeah, it was, it's, it's a weird, it, it's, it's funny when you, I mean, when it's like when you get on anything, you know, you, you go, there are those weird kind of, you know, first couple of days, but uh, it's I, adjusted. It's adjusted really well. Very good. I I had a blood condition. Oh, okay. My, my platelet count got really low, and um, they p- gave me prednisone steroids, mm. and that, that those made me really angry and edgy. Oh, and, maybe it was pre- prednisone that I was thinking of. Okay, and then also no like, progesterone. I'm sorry, I've been saying progesterone. Progesterone is is sorry. That's the birth control pill. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, it's prednisone. Progesterone okay. is yeah. yeah. It's 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 uh uh yeah. It's 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 a it's a female well, hormone. I'm yes, sorry. That's I, that, all right. Well, I was I, there's so many man people man. right now in the. I, I'm sure there's so many women right now in the comment section going, "What the fuck is this guy talking about?" That's that's yeah, how we sorry. get man boobs. Prednisone. Right? prednisone yeah and it it really made me edgy and angry my sister was cracking up and knew that obviously it was the prednisone that was making me oh yeah yeah but to calm me down they put me on clonopin and you know that shit can fell an elephant i mean it was like okay i gotta go lie down now (laughs) because it was it was really bad but um thankfully everything balanced out it was okay so no i i so hear you man and uh yeah I mean, good lord. Uh, Wayne wants to know how was it entering Canada with a Ziploc bag of drugs? Any any border? Uh, no, no border issues. Um, it was the Toronto airport, and I was coming in from a resort, so nobody really cared. That's <laughs> so, cool. I yeah. think they cared more about the rum than the the baggie full of pills. <laughs> um, I that that having been said, I think we already drunk two of them, so we were right at our limit. Uh, <laughs> but. Oh, Wayne says his uh, cat was on uh, prednisone for uh, his asthma. Mm, yeah. Thank you, Wayne. Indeed. It's pretty, I mean, it's a common steroid. It's uh, yeah. for yeah. when you need that, like, super, that super dose to, to, 100%. to get you over, excuse me, over the hump, you know. Yeah. No, um, the, when your platelet count is low, if you cut yourself, you can really, you could technically bleed to death. Yeah. Which was scary. I, I imagine. Is that was that when you were hospitalized? Uh, yes. a few months ago. Well, yeah, okay. No, it was that. I didn't know what I didn't know what the context of all that was. I just knew this you was were twenty years way. ago. No, the, oh, the okay. thing I had right. the thing I had before lockdown. I had a boy. This is great. Welcome to Med. Uh, you know, hey, well, whatever. I mean, so like no, no, when have we ever talked about comics, John? This is true. No, I mean, we're going <laughs> to talk movies and TV. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But um, yeah, I had a leg. Like, I had this weird flesh eating leg infection. That would not go away. They had to scrape it out of me, and it had this. Oh, mess. so you had? Was it that one? Was it? Was it necrotizing fasciitis? Was it that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And uh, and I and I'm uh, I'm over it, but because well, good. I mean, yeah, <laughs> but but my legs are my legs are really slow. During the yeah. lockdown, I bought a two wheeler, and I'm like, all right, I'll ride a bicycle, and you know that that way I'll stay in shape or whatever. And my uh, balance, my balance is fine when I'm walking, but to hit the ha- the handbrakes and then throw your legs down to stop, my legs just don't move fast enough. So I was like tipping right. over like Artie Johnson on laughing on the tricycle. 
right, right, right. Think, you know, and so, and I scraped my arm, and this is during lockdown. I'm like, I'm not breaking a bone and winding up in the hospital. <laughs> COVID. No, yeah. thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, and I, I mean, Wayne will tell you, we were walking around terrific on and Wayne came out there. And yeah, man, I was, I was uh, slow moving, but I'm, yeah. but I'm always. You need a big fun. wheel. You need one of those big wheels, right? <laughs> Uh, honestly, the wheels uh, up here. I want to get I want to get training wheels for my bike, and I'm gonna look ridiculous as an adult man with training wheels. You just take it around the hallway of your apartment building, just like in The Shining. Exactly. Ah, Red Room. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, man. So it's fine. Oh, that's we <laughs> because we're balloon mad uh, every Wednesday night at nine Eastern. Indeed. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yes, uh, it's true. Um, but yeah, no, no, no. Well, I'm really glad, dude. I'm I'm so glad that you are. You know, uh, healing yourself, and again, I'm, I'm, I, uh, you know, we want you to feel better, man. We love you. Well, um, I want to feel better too. Uh, yes. uh, this is the thing. It's like, uh, the other part of it is that you, um, you know, as much as you know uh, that you know the last thirty-five years of behavior uh, have been kind of guided by some little gremlin in your brain um, that you're now medicating it doesn't change the fact that you did it, you know? So you carry a ridiculous amount of guilt uh, afterwards. And that's, that's the other part of it, you know, like just trying to, trying to deal with that and um, try to, you know, talk to people about, you know, okay, well, how do I deal with these feelings now? Cause these are new feelings I've never had before. Like I always felt guilty, but it was a different kind of guilt. Um, and now, now I'm like, okay, so what, you know, because I, I never want to be in a position where I'm um, I don't want to be I, I feel like there is a certain kind of person now who gets and it's typically let's let's face it, it's typically a white dude um, who gets a certain kind of diagnosis and says, wasn't me. You know, it was this all along. Everything I did sure. wrong. It was this. Sure. You know, sure. and I, I don't want to, you know, I, I still did it all. Like I was, I was a bad ally for very many years. I was, you know, I was not a great friend to a lot of people for very many years. And um, that it doesn't, you know, knowing that, again, there was a little gremlin back there that, that went, hee, 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 be bad, you know, doesn't sure. help. Uh, you know, it doesn't take it away, you know. So no, I, get it. I never, I never want anybody to think that I'm, I'm, you know, not uh, responsible for you your act. Yes. Exactly. Like, or, or it, I've, I've, I've addressed this, like it's some kind of, you know, socially, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's some kind of social capital to say yeah. like, yeah, I'm a victim now too. I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm a middle-aged white man. I'm, I'm, I'm doing him. well. I'm in a house. I'm, you know, I'm in a room in my house. Uh, I'm, I'm fine, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, kind of, kind of come to terms with all the different things that are going on. And it helps me be a better parent to my kid because I know what he's going through in a much more uh, visceral way. Um, and so I've been able to kind of say like, well, okay, so this is what I do to deal with this. <laughs> you know, what if you did something like it? <laughs> um, now, that having said that, he's got, you know, he's, he's, uh, uh, soon to be 15 year old boy. So he's got other little gremlins up there too. Um, but you know, uh, it's, it's, it's helping, you know? Um, yeah. Um, doubt wants to know, he's got a comic book question. He was a big, we don't do that here. Yeah, I know. He was, we want your medical questions. Exactly. Uh, (laughs) he's a big fan of Gerard ways Doom patrol run. Mm -hmm. What was your experience working on the book with Nick Darrington and Gerard? Um, I want to say positive. I mean, they were great. Uh, I've, I've known and loved Nick for a great many years and Nick's uh, great guy. Yeah, yeah. And, um, like they were both really great to work with. It's just when I came on the book, it was very late. Um, and my job was to put it back on schedule. Uh, unfortunately much of that work took place around holidays and, uh, <laughs> And I was going through a tough gremlin time and uh, when my computer packed up. So <laughs> there was one Christmas where I had a complete meltdown because I had pages I needed to get in. 
um, because they, you know, they were already late and uh, I, you know, it was around the holidays and Tamara needed them and I needed to scan them and Nick needed to do the last, you know, his, the last little bits that he would do digitally. Yeah. Um, and I had no way to get them to them. And I was just, you know, um, we, it finally all worked out, but you know, um, it, it was, it was one of those, uh, you know, I, I had a long chat with our editor Molly about it at one point. I was like, uh, I, I've just gone through one of the worst <laughs> you know, it's, with this, just these, these last five pages kind of thing has been one of the worst experiences I've had in comics. Um, no book is worth this. So this is, this is your one get out of hell free card. You know, like I'm not doing this anymore for anyone kind of thing. And, but I mean, after that, the schedule had normalized anyway. So we were, Good. we were fine, but I mean, the actual work itself was great. I and mean, it was right. the same, very much the same kind of experience I had with Erica. Um, cause, uh, you know, when I, st when I started inking Erica, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not an inker. I mean, I, I ink myself, but I'd never inked anybody else before. And okay. I'm assuming Erica got, Anderson, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Squirrel okay, Girl. On. Um, yeah, she yeah. she uh, DM'd me on Twitter one night and said, like, uh, I don't know if you are interested in doing this, but I'm slammed. Would you be interested in doing some inks? And I was like, yeah, yeah, why right. not? Um, I didn't have anything else on. I didn't have anything else on at the time. And it seemed like I like Erica. I like her, I like her work, and I was like, yeah, to see what I can do with this, you know. And it worked out really well, and I had a lot of fun. And Erica was a joy to work with, and uh, continues to be. And um, and I was in New York that year, and Nick came by the table, and he was like, "I didn't know you were inking other people." And I was like, "Oh, it was just this, you know." And he was like, "Would you like to ink anyone else?" <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and so, yeah, so I was like, yes. And I was kind of surprised to get the, uh, get, the, get the, get the email, like not too long afterward from Molly saying like, Nick said you're here to help. Um, so it all worked out. I mean, like I said, I, I really, I love, I love inking Nick. Um, he's got a really great line. It was, it was, yeah. um, it was a lot of fun to just kind of, uh, to get in there and, um, rough it up a little bit, you know, kind of thing. And, and yeah. I've since, I've seen, since inked uh, Joe Canona's as well, uh, a little yeah. bit on uh, Dial H for Hero, which is funny because it was, I did that uh, after I think my first six issues of um, uh, Books of Magic, uh, which I uh, penciled and inked myself. Um, but it got to be too much because I didn't know I didn't know somebody was going to be following or sorry I didn't know that nobody was going to be following me I thought I was just going to be on for six issues and then it comes down so well how do you want to schedule these next six issues what would you huh because I thought somebody else was already working on them so I wound up bringing in other people to um finish to finish my work um Brian Chirillo on the on the uh, on a few issues and then uh, again my my buddy Craig Telfer um, and, uh, but so I'm basically, I'm doing layouts and pencils for books of magic, which I don't have time to ink, but then I'm doing inks on dial H for heroes, <laughs> which was a weird. And so the, when the editors, um, when I was talking to the editors, they go, Oh, we just need to get you into the system. I was like, I'm already in the system. I pencil one of your other books. <laughs> so, but it was weird. I like inking other people is always, um, it's a weird, like it can be a weird, uh, uh, training exercise, like it's it, it, it's something to kind of like wrap your head around. Uh, and to be clear, I mean, when I was working with them, I, I wasn't finishing; I was inking. You know, um, and there is there is a bit of a line of distinction. Yeah, by um, all means, explain it because I mean, uh, when when Sinkevich was working with Norton on Green Arrow, mm -hmm. the end product was very different from both Bill and Mike. And, yeah, you know, as opposed to again, you know, being true to the pencils and and uh, which I assume is more inking rather than finishing. Yeah, it. I mean, a lot of it's got to do with I think with Sinkevich. I mean, no, no matter what you give 
Bill Sienkiewicz, it's going to look like Bill Sienkiewicz when he's done. I hear you. you know, like, yeah. um, I know well, you, there's nothing wrong with it. That's if I, if I penciled something, if I penciled something, you know, with, with a mechanical pencil down to the square millimeter and I handed it over to Bill Sienkiewicz, I would still want to get pages back that look like Bill Sienkiewicz, you know? I understand. Um, but, uh, um, the idea is basically, um, you know, I, I always look at uh, 80, my, my touchstone for this kind of stuff is uh, 1980s Stern, Bishima, Palmer, Avengers, right? Yep. And if you've ever looked at um, John Bishima's pencils, he didn't really do pencils. He did layouts. They're very scribbly. They're very, like, it, for some of them, like I've seen some of the Conan ones, I can barely decipher them. You know, and, uh, that, yeah. yeah, you need to take, I mean, you need to, but that's because he had on the other end, he had a Villagrans, he had Ernie Cohen, he had yeah. uh, Redondo, he had Nebras, he had, you know, Palmer, he had uh, however many other people who knew what they were doing. Totally. And they were, they were finishers in their own, they were artists in their own right. They were finishers in their own, again, yep. which is not, not to take anything away from anchors at all. Um, it's, no. it's just, it's, you're just, you're flexing a slightly different muscle because it's, you're not just, you're not just following the line. Uh, and even an anchor doesn't just follow the line. Like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm doing a lot of like back and forth because I don't want anybody to get their hurt, their feelings hurt. No, I um, get but the, the point is, um, you're, you're, you're doing more of the drawing, um, than yeah. you normally would. You're figuring stuff out more than you normally necessarily would be. Uh, if you were just doing a straight inking job, particularly with what kind of the constraints of modern inking are, because nowadays um, you've got, and it's been this way for 20 years, but uh, you've got pencilers who are essentially inking in the pencils. And you are, as the inker, your job is to go in and bring that out and just make it look, you know, slick and full and, and right kind of thing. Yes, because um, you still you still need to bring something of yourself to that final product. Um, uh, you know, with me, like I said, it's that I, you know, it's a weird kind of dirtying it up with dry brushy bits and little ticks here and there and, you know, whatever. Sure. Um, you know, Klaus Jansen has his, you know, you, you can see what he's doing. And again, he's kind of approaching it more like a finisher, but it's still he's still following what he needs to do kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of a lot of guys, there's there's kind of a sliding scale of what you can do, what what you what you have access to, but if you slide the scale from one side to the other on the pencils, so if you slide the detail way down, then the anchor has more to do, and yeah. and you know you you hit a certain once you hit a certain line in the middle, it goes from being inking to being finishing. I'm with you, um, Alex. Sandler. And that's and that's the difference, you know. So yeah. Alex Saviak um, worked with Will Eisner on one of the last things Will did, and it was like a five or eight page uh, crossover between the Spirit and the Escapist, Michael Chabon's character, right, 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 yeah. Cavalier and Clay. And you know, um, I saw the very bare bones layouts and and pencils that Eisner did, and like you said, they were shapes. Mm. And and Alex is a great enough mimic to as a finisher make it look like Eisner and it was great. Yeah. And I remember people saying, oh wow, you know, Eisner had it till the end. And he did. And I mean other yeah. other projects that Eisner well, did. Well the thing is like I mean your job as a cartoonist is just it's not about the finish line. You know, it's about it's about telling a story. And Eisner was still as sharp as anyone at telling a story Absolutely. by that point. But you know, like age will rob you of your eyesight. It will rob you of a steady hand. It will rob you of a number of things. I've I I already know that at 48, you know um so there's nothing there's nothing to take away you know it's all it's all already still there but it's it, it, on Saviak's um side it's not even really about mimicry it's like he knows what he knows what was supposed to be there like he right so he did it you know but that again that, that becomes finishing rather than just straight inking 100%. Um, but there's a certain like i said it's all on a sliding scale and so there's yeah. a certain amount of finishing that gets that takes place in in any inking job and i again like i don't care i don't care how much detail are, are in the pencils um you're not a photocopier 
<laughs> you know, like no. you, you, something of yourself, something of your skills, uh, whether it be the way you do a line, how you, uh, how you, how you finish a line, how you, how you make your marks, how you, what tools you use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, will show you to be, you know, will show through. There's that great, um, book that came out years ago through Dark Horse about the, you know, the art of inking that, um, that had those Steve Rude pages and then all those, uh, every, all sorts of other artists, um, inking yeah. them. And, yeah. and, and, and they had like the difference between this is a layout and this is, and these are complete pencils. Now, again, it's Steve Rude. So his layout looks like a lot of what people call pencils. And right. it's, and that's, and in fact, those were closer to the kinds of layouts that I try to give people when I'm working with somebody else to, to finish something. I like to make sure that all the information is there. Um, but, um, that's not always true, but again, like it's just watching, even with the, you know, the quote unquote finished pencils, seeing in that book, seeing the broad spectrum of different inkers doing that kind of straight down the line to them, straight down the line inking work. Yeah. Um, again, you're seeing just vast differences on how they approach things. And that's really it, you know, like that's, it's, it's always going to be, I mean, with any collaborative art form, it's always, uh, whether it's a writer working with an artist or, or a penciler working with an inker or with the artist working with a colorist or, you know, whatever, there's always a conversation and that's, that's the art. Like that's where it happens. I, know, so. I love seeing, and maybe we've talked about this before as well, uh, back in the fifties when Simon and Kirby were working together and it looked very different from again, uh, a purely Simon piece, Joe Simon piece, and a purely Jack Kirby piece. Yeah. Or name your favorite Marvel inker on Kirby, whether it's Sinnott or Mike Royer or whomever. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, no, I understand. And I, and I, uh, I, 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 again, I always find it interesting because it really, you see the collaboration. Yeah. And it's I, always fun too when you see people who, who are able, like with Simon and, 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 and Kirby, like with one book, you know, Simon would, would, would pencil and Kirby would ink. And on another book, Kirby would pencil and Simon would ink. Yep. And, you know, seeing how that kind of morphs and transforms. And it was yeah. the same thing with, um, oh God, what were their names? Uh, Russ. Russ, Andrew and Esposito. Yeah. Uh, Andrew and Esposito, like they, they did this, a lot of the same kinds of things. Yes. And it was so amazing. Like they, I've got that book, I think it was called enough. Was it called enough said? Um, they did a humor. They did their own humor book oh, back when Mad oh, was a big that. deal. Okay. Um, I think it was called. I I, I could be wrong. Um, uh, in fact, I'm almost definitely wrong. But well, uh, Fanographics put it out. Uh, they okay. only did about three issues of it. Fanographics put it out. Um, I want to say about 15 years ago, and full color, uh, just reprints of those original books, and uh, they were amazing because they it's just the two of them trying to do mad and succeeding uh, a lot of the time oh they but were the amazing sheer work. amount of of you know one guy going over the other guy or one or the other guy going over the yeah, one guy you know, kind of thing, going yeah. back and forth yeah. but also trading out styles and you know really pushing that that because i always say about style it's always you know you you've got abstraction over here and you've got realism over here and you just slide the scale. That's all style. Is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's all, it's all you drawing, but you just slide the scale. So they're, they're sliding all over the place and it, it's amazing work. Just beautiful. It's like when, cause I, I was a, I growing up, I was a Russ, uh, a, a Russ Andrew, uh, Spider-Man guy. So and much. One of my first comics was the, uh, uh, was a die. No, it was like a super size of. Um, there was a character called Rapier. Sure. Uh, yes. Who was like a yeah. Uh, the last like it was at it was I had the book out at the cottage and the last like six pages of it got ripped out years ago or something. Ah. Like that. But yeah. Um, but uh, it was I loved it. I was I was just like this is oh well, my god like this is the greatest thing ever you know kind of thing. So I've been a Ross Andrew guy forever. I always and then, you know Tari say... Force and you know whatever, yes so. yes well even. Um... Didn't they do the the Jerry Conway Spider Man Superman crossover? I believe they were the artists. Probably, like, yeah. You know, yeah. And, no, I always say Ross is left out of the conversation of great Spider Man artists yeah. a lot, and it's like his stuff was so great, and and especially yeah. and then Esposito as an anchor on top of him or on Absolute, top of anybody or else. Versa. You know, Absolutely, man. no. I've I, been really uh, lately. I've been really getting into Jack Sparling. 
Um, Very nice. Going back and 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 print like. I mean, I can't. I'm. It's not like I'm going anywhere to dive through dollar bins or anything like that. But I'm. I. I, I do a lot of kind of typing, typing art searches. Sure. Uh, in sure. into Google and and finding things that way, or or on eBay or on Comic Art Finder or whatever, which Wayne turned me on to. Damn you, Wayne. Um, so many, so many things out of my price range nowadays. Um, you know, I bought but, uh, uh, at Terrificon. I bought sorry, a chicken. I bought a chicken page from a one a one shot Magneto book, and it's so great. And I'm so glad I got it. And also, I was going to say, uh, Michael pointed out that uh, Carmine Infantino's pencils. He says never look better when they were un, when they were inked by Murphy Anderson. I would say the same thing about uh, Kurt Swan and uh, Swanderson as they would build themselves mm. together when they were doing Superman and stuff. And yeah, man, no, it's. Again, this is the joy that we get from from seeing some of these, you know, Silver Age, Bronze Age greats. Yeah, and, and well, really the other thing too is great. Well, and again, like a, a lot of a lot of what what um, the guys were doing back then were 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 finishing looser pencils, um, and they really like you've got a guy like Tom Palmer who's just drawing with the brush, you know, like he's just yep. filling in so much stuff, and it's all when you really look really closely at it. It kind it almost falls apart, you know. Like it's there are these weird marks that you're like, that's not right. But as soon as you go back, you're like, it's all real. It's all completely real. <laughs> it's everything has volume. Everything, everything is right, you know. And I, I love that. I wish I could get there. But and but this is the thing. It's like this is where I'm. I'm finding like I'm. I'm now going and looking. I mean, I was always into a lot of the Filipino guys, but I'm I'm now looking at yeah. guys like Frank Springer and 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 uh, Jack Sparling, and and seeing what they were because you look at all these guys on top of other guys, and how those different you know how how they would mesh differently because it was basically a lot of you know I got I got five chicken pages who's available. Who wants it? Who wants it? You know. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, I can't remember. I think it's Springer that did that famous chicken um, uh, uh, Star Wars story. Um, yeah. I think it's Springer, uh, and then and then the rest of that the rest of that storyline was done by Palmer. Um, but that was that was like uh, that was like a weird foundational run for me because I've told this story before. Um, that uh, when we were kids, my parents were not cool about me reading comic books. It was fine to read Tainte and Aesthetics because those weren't comic books. They were they were bigger and they had harder paper and they had endings and they had you know they were sold in bookstores. They weren't on there. They weren't trash at the grocery store kind of thing. So there's just nothing like just no. And uh, my mom hates it when I tell a story. And uh, we were out at the cottage and we went to, we went out to a friend's place. Uh, it was uh, w one of my dad's friends from, from childhood. And she had been a, or still was, I think at the time, a, a school teacher. And as soon as my brother and I got there, she pulled out this big old box of, the you know, cardboard box of comic books and plunked them down in front of us. And we went, <gasps> you know, and, uh, <laughs> My parents made a face and she caught it and went up one side of them and down the other about like how good comics were for helping kids to get a grasp on reading and, you know, like uh, different ways kids can associate one thing with another, which helps the whole process kind of thing. And um, I used to be a lot more articulate about this, but again, my, my mother's hatred of this story has burnt a lot of it out of my head. Um, but anyway, right, um, so when we got home, we were living in uh, Northern Ontario back then. So when we got home to Timmins um, that summer, uh, my dad just hit a, a bunch of uh, garage sales and came home with a box of comic books. And he like, Here you go, you know. That and is, yeah. I, yeah, and uh, in that uh, box were a lot of like funny animal comics, were a lot of gold yeah. key funny animal comics, uh, and a couple of gold key horror things that freaked cool. me out. That's I've how much of a pussy I was. Right. Um, and um, uh, a lot of Star Wars stuff. Um, there was very little superhero in there, but it was a lot of Star Wars. Um, and 
Yeah, that run, that little run was in there. And I remember when I was a little kid, it was one of those things. I had the same reaction to Ditko because after that summer, my mom was like, okay, you can buy comic books. That's cool with me. You're not allowed to buy any comic book that says to be continued at the end. So I've got the, I've got the last issue of a lot of runs. Uh, but but I was still able, like, as long as it didn't say those words, I could buy it. So I wound up buying, I think I went down, I went down the corner store. My mom was like, buy, you, you can go buy a comic book, but you have to buy one for your brother. So I bought myself, um, it was either the last issue, I think it was either the last issue of Contest of Champions, or it was that uh, Alex Toth uh, Action Comics Annual. It was one of the two. Wow! Um, sure. And I, I brought my, I bought my brother a reprint of like Spider Man number five or something like that. The first appearance of, of Craven, because okay. I was such a miserable little son of a bitch that I was. I looked at the Ditko stuff. And I was like, um, but over there, I mean, you didn't care. I mean, you didn't carry the way really. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, I ostensibly bought myself two comics, uh, but, uh, um, it was, it was weird. It was one of those things that like, I I had, and again, I had the same reaction to those Chaken, uh, Springer, Chaken Palmer, uh, but particularly the, the Springer ones that I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. I hated it, but I kept going back to it because there was something there. There was something that just... I just, you know, there's, there's this beautiful thing over here, this beautiful object of art called Contest of Champions number three. And I will read it until the covers come off, but I still keep coming back to this thing. And I don't know what it is. It's ugly and it's obtuse, but I love it. Oh my God, I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, and and that's, I, that, that was yeah. the weird, like there was just something there. And I had the same reaction to Kirby when I saw him the first time. Like there was something powerful, but ugly. But you know, yes. but I embraced that. Like it was, it was something really powerful there. And Tim, Tim um, Bradstreet and I talked about Frank Robbins in exactly the same way during his Invaders run. And I'm like, this is yeah. ugly. Why do that's, I keep coming back? That's what got me into Sparling. Uh, recently. I understand. Yes, I was looking right. at Frank Robbins right. pages and all that Sparling stuff. And it was absolutely like, oh. yes, indeed, hundred percent, man. Good lord, I no, I get it, bud. And and also, I was going to say. Regarding parents and comics, uh, and and uh, word balloon watchers and, and listeners have probably heard me say this story before. My youngest uh, nephew was having a reading problem, and I was giving him comics. And my brother-in-law was quite the jock. And at first, he's like, you know, man, I, I'm trying to get him more into sports. I don't know about this comic book stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to break it. I don't it know yet. about this reading. Exactly. Well, that's what I told him. I'm like, dude, I go. He can read stats. I'm like, he's <laughs> exactly. I'm like. He's reading and liking it. And literally, he yeah. thought for a second and he goes, you're right. I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, yeah. it's okay, man. I, oh, that was I a get thing. it. But that I'm was like, the thing yeah, that I had, a, I had a throwdown with um, my kid's English teacher when he was in grade three, I think. Um, because uh, we'd had, he, Graham had had a couple of really awful years in elementary okay. school. It yeah. was, uh, grade one, grade two, his teachers were awful. He was being bullied horribly. Mm-hmm. My wife and I were both, um, and this was before the ADHD uh, uh, diagnosis, and we were both going like, all we need to do is find two, th- two, if we could just find another two grand a month, we could send him to private school. Like, we, we just kept doing that because we were just like, we and we were really like, are we even going to send him back? Oh God. And it's a school right down the street from us. It's a really good school, you know? Um, so anyway, so we wound up sending him cause we couldn't find an extra two grand. Um, however, that year things turned around. His, his main teacher was fantastic. Like just absolutely incredible. But he had an English teacher that would come in cause he, he's in French immersion. So he had an English teacher would come in and he brought with him this whole, like um, you would get points for reading books. Which is great. Uh, it's fine. Whatever. Sure. Um, but they could only be a certain kind of book. Um, it could only be prose or nonfiction, but a book book. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and and typically, even, even then, I, I think it needed to be prose. Um, what had come back to me from Graham, because he had only kind of half listened to it, was uh, it can't, the only thing you can't read is a comic book. 
but that was well, that was one of his that was one of his his um one of his one of his when he was describing what the program was no comics uh no plays like a kid's gonna read plays no okay. poetry yeah. you know like whatever uh he wanted basically them to learn english grammar by osmosis so he wanted some he wanted a book that said run he said you know sure to where she said you know kind of thing he wanted them to have yeah. that which yeah. is dumb but i i suppose that kind of makes sense but again it got reported back to me that like no comics no points forget it and i went this was right after i'd worked on how tunes Okay. So I was primed. I was pumped. I was like, I have just, motherfucker, I've just made an educational comic for kids Don't that teaches them science. Don't you, fuck, I will fuck you up. You know, so I was just, I was just ready for a fight. And uh, an online friend who, who, who literally um, studies uh, how comics interconnect with education armed me with a bunch of like just textbooks you know just like all sorts of articles and peer-reviewed studies Good. and things so Great. i just came with a phone book and put it down in front of him i was like what's your problem um and the you know we wound up having an argument but we finally figured out that it, it had been a miscommunication but in the end my real problem and i was too angry by that point to really communicate it, so i wound up writing them a letter to to apologize for my behavior, okay. Okay. but also to spell out what my real problem was, Certainly. which is, okay, so you, you've got this system where you're, um, you're giving a value to books. Like you're, yes. you're, you're in a way you're monetizing books. Yeah. Um, and, um, that's, that's fine. Cause you want to, you want kids to feel like they're accruing, um, points in this system for having read, these books that's sure. great like we did a thing like that when i was when i was a kid you know yeah, me too here's the problem with putting limits on it though is that okay you've got gavin he's a slow reader he's never been really good uh with you know the, the kid i'm making up by the way there's a kid no, you, <laughs> you've got parents from asian court school there's no gavin that i know of. i'm sorry <laughs> um but uh uh you know, he, he's, he's had a tough time reading. He has a tough time concentrating. But you know what? This summer, he, he discovered Bone. He discovered Amulet. Right. He right. read six of those things. Yeah. And he is feeling amazing. Because look at the stack of pages that this kid has read. And he feels it. great. And he gets to school. And his teacher said, those don't count. Those don't count. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that was the real problem that I had. And that totally was, and it, it's, it's a problem I still have. Like, I get it. Like, if you're going to set parameters in upper grades, even lower grades, but you can't, you can't do it in a way that dismisses the hard work or accomplishments or achievements um, that a kid may have made, you know? I so agree. And, I and regardless of whether it's Gavin or if it's, you know, Kimberly who is writing, who is reading at the top of her grade, I don't give a fuck. They're reading. 100%. They're sitting down. They're looking at a page. They're putting two and two together. And, you know, this guy's like looking at the, the how tunes that I handed him. He's like, well, we don't have anything like this in our library. And it's like, yes, you do. Good for you. <laughs> like, Good this for is you. the second copy I'm donating to your library. Now you do. Uh, but moreover, <laughs> you have Bone in your library. You have Amulet in your library. You have all sorts of stuff in your library. Yep. Like, maybe you should visit it once in a while. <laughs> um, but uh, he was like, well, this is my problem. He turns to a page and it's like the two, there are four panels on the kit page and it's two kids running up the stairs and there's maybe three or four word balloons on, on the thing. He's like, this is, this is what my problem is. is you know, it's just saying, huh, huh, uh, you know, whatever. Right. Um, and it's like, okay, well go two pages from there. And it's, it's all text and it's a, and it, and moreover, it's, 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 it's a, it's an essay about energy. Like, you know, like you can't, what are you picking and choosing for? Again, I understand the thought process behind what you are trying to sure. accomplish with this. Sure. But it's a it's a faulty thought process. Right. And it and it's shitty to some kids. It's Absolutely. shitty to all kids. Hundred percent. You know, because there's yeah. nothing wrong. Like, oh great, I banged out a Harry Potter book, but you if you bang out a, a couple of 
bone books as well. I'd rather you read bone, frankly, as far as I know, Jeff Smith is in the turf. Um, so it's, <laughs> I, you know, like yeah, I, I yeah. It's, 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 he's never named anybody Ching Chong, you know, Neil, Neil, um, Neil, uh, Neil Gaiman always points out that when you read comics, you are using both parts of your brain because yeah. the visual aspect and the text are yeah. you're up, you know you, so it's even more complex which is exactly what that 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 uh school teacher friend of my parents was saying like is she literally back there in back then in like 1978 you know she was or 79 she was sure. like she was basically saying the exact same stuff like she yeah. was like look these things are great cognitively they're 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 seeing what they're reading and they're putting them putting them together they're getting yeah. a sense of pace they're getting a sense of the rhythms of of Absolutely. action they're getting a sense of you know uh, how to propel a story forward you, you're right down to just reading from left to right from top to bottom and flipping a page like yeah. it's all there uh, if again, if you were if you were a novice reader, it's all there on those levels. But if you know, there's more complicated stuff you can read, and there's more stuff to enjoy. And you, either you graduate, or you don't, or you gather things together, or you don't. You know, like um, I just it it it, it drives me nuts to uh, oh Wayne, um, it drives me. <laughs> um, it it drives me nuts to kind of see those weird limitations be put on kids. You know? I get it, buddy. No, you know, uh, Bendis was teaching uh, comic writing at, I can't remember which original, I think it was University of Oregon. They had a change at the top of the uh, English department or the, yeah, whatever, the writing department that he was part of. And they're like, uh, I don't see a value of this. I don't think we want you teaching the class anymore. And he's like, yeah. fine. And he went to Portland State and kept on going. <laughs> yeah. Everything's fine. And I mean, yeah, man, it's like, no, if you guys don't get it, that's that's your problem. Meanwhile, I mean, good Lord, as you well know, uh, storytelling, I can, I can tell you a lot of screenwriters, sadly, that work for Star Trek that don't know how to do proper storytelling. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. a lot of them, a lot of them write comic books that, uh, people offer me. Um, Sorry, absolutely. I, yeah, man. I mean, that's the thing. Like I, I, the constant, it seems, and again, I, I'm not, I'm not throwing anybody that I work with under the bus with this, but, no. uh, I constantly, I, I had a good decade of, and I still do of editors come to me saying like, Hey Tom, you want to work on this book? And I'm like, great. Has the right, yeah, sh whatever. Has the writer ever worked in comics before? And they're like, no, they're the TV guy. And we figured you'd be the perfect person to teach them how to make comics. And I was like, am I getting paid half your wage? Like what? What? <laughs> it shouldn't be my job to teach them how to make comics, especially, yeah. si especially if I'm doing a weird visual edit of the script to make it work uh like story just storytelling wise and they're still getting all the credit for, for of, of authorship i hear you <laughs> over yeah. the whole yes. story you know yeah. i just like can i get paid you know a whole bunch more please you know and the answer is always no because you know the answer is always have, no. have, they come uh, <laughs> have they come to you at all especially dc they've got those ya graphic novels they've been doing the last few years and i know Yes, and I know there. Okay. They, obviously, maybe they haven't come to you, but I know there are a few experienced uh, artists that will do breakdowns for these newer artists to follow because they've never done storytelling before. They're they're. I would be. Artists. I'm putting it on the record right now. I would be more than happy to do that. Uh, uh, I know some of the. I mean, I I know a few. I know a few artists uh, in comics that uh, in even more that you know for. Not even just the YA stuff, like just in uh, oh, like yeah. regular, regular, regular superhero y sure. underwear pants comics are doing layouts for other people. Well, you know, uh, that's that's how Ramita Jr., or rather Ramita Sr., when he first did Daredevil, Stan's, Stan wasn't crazy about his storytelling, and he asked Kirby to break mm. down, you know, action scenes to, to show Ramita Sr. how to do mm. it. And then he learned yeah. it and say, like, okay, great, I get it. I get it. Yeah, and and absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm happy to do that. I mean, I can I can. Uh, I mean, honestly, that's uh, especially at the level that that you know, I wouldn't necessarily have to do what I do for layouts. I would just need to do 
little teeny ones right. um, for somebody like to figure that. it out. Yeah. I can do that in a couple of days. I'm, I'm more, more than happy. I'll, I'm I'll you, DC I'll, Comics, Mr. DC. I am more than happy to take that job. You know, God, um, and I truly, man, I and I don't mean this in any disparaging way, but I mean, God, I, I, you might have read the headline. They they shelved that Batgirl movie. Oh, yeah, uh, I read a lot of that. In post. Yeah, nuts. And, and I mean, really, just Discovery and DC is still trying to figure out like the the structure of what they're doing. Yeah. The one good thing is I keep saying, and I and this is just supposition as an outsider, the fact that Discovery, because of all the DIY stuff they do with their brand, and that books are such an important part of the component of the TV shows and other things that they make, that they likely appreciate the value of comics for the DC brand and aren't just looking, yeah, I like your face. Obviously, yeah. you might disagree, but I, I think I so. don't know. I mean, I, I, every time somebody says somebody might appreciate comics, I mean, I remember uh, I went to Worldcon one year and I was all excited that Kindles were going to start coming out in color because in my head that meant there was going to be a renaissance of illustration um, because it wouldn't cost as much to print a book so you could hire an illustrator. Well, nobody's doing that. They're just saving the money, you know, like yeah. It, yeah. it's so I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I've, I've never watched a discovery show. I don't, I don't know anything about discovery. Um, so I, you know, I, I have no idea how one thing is going to uh, affect another. I think somebody just came, somebody new just came in at the top and decided we're doing this instead of this. And uh, we're claiming a loss, um, I guess, you know. Well, yeah, that's um, but I mean that, that those first movie, announcements yeah. kind of came out to something like two hundred million dollars in production costs for all the stuff they they just axed. Yeah, I, none of it makes sense to me. And and you know, taking things off of HBO, uh, HBO Max, um, with yep. more of that is going to happen. I have no. And the thing is, I don't have access to HBO Max up here. We have. You know, I want to. I, yes, and I so, mean again, talking to Wayne. Uh, we always discuss nerd TV yeah. and it's like, you know, well, you know, and he always tells me, okay, that's on Disney as opposed to yeah. down here being on HBO Max or Amazon or whatever. Well, yeah. I mean, well, basically the stuff that's on Disney is we don't have Hulu up here. So Disney owns Hulu. Right. Um, right. And so all of, all of the Hulu stuff just pops up here on Disney, uh, on, on Disney along with now uh, all the Fox stuff. Right. Least, yes. The Fox stuff that's streamable. Yes. Um, there's still like, uh, you know, there's still a deep bank of Fox uh, stuff that is not streamable um, anywhere. Or maybe there's some international uh, licensing deal that's keeping yeah. it uh, off of, you know, off of Disney and on Netflix or Tubi or wherever the hell. But. Uh, you know, uh, with a lot of this stuff, it's it, a lot of it's like international licensing agreements yeah. that either do or do not include streaming. So there's a lot of like weird, but, um, most of the time, if it's a Hulu show or if it's a Fox thing, it's on Disney plus eventually. I mean, I think the first, only the first two seasons of what we do in the dark, uh, are on Disney plus up here. Okay. Um, what we do in the shadows? Even though it's a Fox, yeah. even though it's a uh, what we sorry, what we do in the shadows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even though it's even though it's a Fox show, they've only got yes. the first two seasons available. I mean, I just I just buy them on iTunes, but um, like that's the thing. And uh, with uh, Crave, it's got uh, most of the HBO HBO Warner stuff uh, and all Paramount stuff. Um, so all the, yeah. like, I, I keep hearing people complaining about Paramount Plus and things like that. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, the only reason we have Crave is for, you know, a couple of different, um, HBO things and a couple of different Paramount things. I'm with you. Um, and, uh, you know, the, it, it's kind of a first look for certain Warner, um, uh, features, um, that then like that stay on the platform for about five months and then move on to Netflix or, oh, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so like, so like the, the invisible, the, the, the most recent invisible man movie was on Crave. For, movie. Yeah. Yeah. Was on Crave for X amount of time and then moved over to Netflix, you know? 
uh, it's there's not a lot of rhyme or reason, uh, and every so often something will just pop up on Prime. You're like, why is this on Prime? Um, because Prime is the worst. <laughs> oh, you know, down here I think, for I for Prime. movies at least, there's nothing there. It's 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 you know, I used to make the comparison of Tubi as being like the greatest and longest uh, 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 VHS wall at a convenience store. Hundred like percent. If you had an inv- if you had if you had the 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 movie rental wall at your local convenience store and went on for infinity, um, that's Tubi. I'm and it's you. amazing. It's amazing yes. for that reason. Yes. Um, Prime up here is the dark side of that. Like for movies. Hilarious. Yeah. Um, it's just because it's all the same crap, but it's just the worst iterations of that crap. Um, but then all of a sudden you've got like Suspiria. Uh, Yay. <laughs> you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah. But, but here's the thing. Prime. I don't know if it's the same for you down there, but Tell Prime me. up here strips away any native subtitles. So if your movie has subtitles in it um, that are, are necessary for the plot, because Suspiria takes place in English, French, and German. Yep. Um, it's it, While you're watching, I tried watching Suspiria on Prime uh, when it first came to Prime, because I hadn't seen it in theaters, and I was really excited to watch it. Sure. And I got, I got more than halfway through the film when I realized there were supposed to be subtitles. Oh, my God. I was... There was enough of the English stuff. I, I understand <laughs> French, so I was getting the French stuff. And I just figured it was supposed to be kind of like a murky European, right. like you get what sure. you get kind of thing. Absolutely. But then there was that scene where like all the witches are at the restaurant. They're all laughing about like making the two cops <laughs> screw each other. And spoilers for Suspiria. <laughs> and they're all talking in German. I'm like, wait a minute. Should I'm I have the standing. subtitles on or something? I went Hilarious. in and I turned them on, but it wasn't subtitles. It was closed captioning. So now everything was subtitled, including, you know, tippy taps on the claw, you know, like, hilarious, you know, like scary music, you know, stuff like that. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do this. I can't, like, I know, I know that's ableist, but I I just can't, like, I, I can't watch a movie like that. It drives me insane. So I went up buying it. So I could watch the subject because I had read oh this thing. God. I was like, he had color coded the director had color coded the subtitles. So everybody would be, I mean, which is sure. w- whatever. I, I, I thought there would be more of like, when I read that, it was like somebody was breathlessly saying how great that is. Like you can't tell the difference between French and German. Really? <laughs> you know? Um, but, uh, but here's the funny one. Here's the funny one. District nine. Yes. On prime. No subtitles. So when in the aliens are speaking, just clicking and right. clicking and clucking around, you have no nothing. idea. Yeah, nothing. Crazy. And it Crazy. makes it a very different movie. I can, which is which is kind of. I, I actually wound up watching the entire thing like that because it is, is so a funny. very different film experience when oh. you're doing it that way. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, it was it, you know it's it's weird you know um, and uh, and then I, I got into a lot of Korean movies over the pandemic. Um, yeah. yeah. Just because the you know we have so many stream like we cut our cable, so uh, we just went hog wild with streaming services. And I found when I discovered Tubi, I got Tubi so that I could watch a documentary uh, about the family that runs or the cult that runs or former cult that runs uh, uh, cafe. Is it called Cafe Wellness in? Uh, it's in California. It's that place where um, it's a veg. It's a vegan restaurant, and you have to say. Like, I feel like you look at the menu and it's things like, you know, a salad is called wonderful. And you have to say, I feel wonderful to, to order it. Order Somebody, out. some California person will be able to. But anyway, that was originally started by a cult and it's still okay. run by former cult members. And that is a cult. And Are I you? wanted to, I wanted to watch, I wanted to sure. watch uh, the documentary about that cult. I can't remember what they're called. So that's how I discovered Tubi. Yeah, and then I yeah. started and which and I was just in front of the curb with Tubi. I'm a Okay. You know, uh and 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 uh I, I was I was one of the first people to go, have you seen this thing? This thing is awesome. Well and it's um, it's funny. And, I'm, and, and, and you know, I'm a child of the 80s. I don't give a shit if they're commercials. Like, I, that's great, exactly you know? what I was going to say, Tom. You know? Exactly. But we don't care about As I was, as I, as I'd right. start scrolling through Tubi, like late at night, like I'm part of my kind of bad. Um, one of the ADHD bad habit things that I've been doing that I had been doing and I'm trying to stop is 
um, you you stay up late to try and reclaim time for yourself. So well, it's video um, I, I was watch, basically watching a movie a night after my wife would go to bed. So I was like stumbling up to bed at two o'clock in the morning. And uh, but I discovered this rich vein uh, and a lot of it was um, um, a lot of it was uh, kind of post uh, train to Poisson and yeah. uh, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, the big one that won the Oscar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bong Joon Ho. Um, I know I, I'm blanking too, but I know it's spot, not Spotlight. Um, no, 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 no. Spotlight's the oh, best. Parasite. I know exactly what you're Parasite. Parasite, indeed. Yes. Yeah. So it was. It, it was Very post good. some of those things, and yeah, I was. Yeah. So I was like, you know, Parasite had come out, and I was like, oh God, I want to watch more of his movies, and you know, Mother is on Tubi. And one of his other, uh, ho the host is on Tubi, and I found Memories of Murder on YouTube. Um, and so I was just going through the whole thing. But while you're doing that, it's suggesting these other Korean movies, The Source Family, that's it. Um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, it, it starts suggesting all these other, uh, all these other Korean movies. So okay. I started watching, I started watching a lot of, uh revenge movies that i don't i can't do revenge movies anymore i you know i watched bong joon ho's i watched um oh what's his name uh park uh the guy um he had a he had a trilogy he made he made the the movie um uh the american movie uh oh oh i'm a bad person hey anyway, uh there's another You're like big time but another about. very big there's another very very big um korean director who's made a couple of american movies okay i cannot remember his name no park problem. is the last part of it um but oh, uh, uh anyway Wayne wants to know if it's old park chan wook park chan wook okay uh no but i think park chan wook made that um but he he made uh what is called uh uh, uh, the 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 revenge trilogy, and I've watched all of those. Okay, and uh, I can't I can't do revenge because they're such bummers. So I started watching Korean action and espionage movies, and Great. there and 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 a lot of a lot of historical kind of action dramas. And good God, they're so great. They're like they're so there's so much wonderful stuff, and um, just really really getting into it, starting to recognize actors and following them from one thing to another. Um, and I was. Uh, those are Japanese. Um, that one, that's one of the, yeah, that's part of it. Uh, Mr. Right. Vengeance and, uh, right. yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, uh, at any rate, um, Tubi's amazing. Dude, Tubi yeah, yeah, has yeah. shitty and they're hilarious. All those bad 80s Cinemax TNA movies. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and, I mean, and great documentaries and like you said, amazing foreign films. It's the and again, it's free. And yeah. I tell all my friends that are like, oh, you know, whatever. I'm yeah, I'm like, like you said, I'm disappointed in Amazon, whatever. And I'm like, uh, Tubi's waiting for you. And like obscure yeah. TV shows, it's it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah, no, there's a there's a website, and I'm looking for it now on my on my cellular phone because it's always open called Just Watch. Um, okay. that it's will tell you ever? what oh yeah, it's 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 just a website. Um, that you can uh, that you can go on and set it to wherever you live, uh, like whatever country you live in, yeah. and type in the name of a movie, and it will tell you where it's what service it's streaming on, how it's available to rent, how it's available to buy, cool. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So anytime anything comes out or I find out about something, I'm I'm on Just Watch right away. Yeah. Um, and I'll find out, oh, this is, you know, and uh, nine times out of 10, it's, it's either, you know, it's, it's playing on two, if it's really obscure, it's on Tubi yeah. uh, or it's on, um, uh, you know, something that I'm surprised to find it on uh, or it's on one of the, <laughs> or it's on libra uh, library. Yes. Hoopla. Um, I'm a Hoopla big is the guy. best. I love Hoopla. Hoopla. Excellent. Um, I've watched, I've watched a lot, watch a lot of stuff there too, that I can, a good I can only find as well. Sorry? Could, you could borrow comics on Hoopla as well. Digital oh, really cool. Uh, the version of Hoopla, for some reason that I've got, does not allow me to, to access some of the, uh, the full range of things. Because there was, uh, there's an audio, there's supposed to be an audio book section there as well. Um, that yeah. is, I don't know if that's, I don't know if it's Canadian thing is, is the reason it's not on there, yeah. but it's not, it's not accessible to me. Okay. So it's just music, right. TV, and movies. 
got it um, for me. I have another, but I have another uh, one called Libby for audiobooks. Um, but yeah, I mean, library apps are the best, you know. So it, it, there's okay. there's a lot of you know. So yeah, I've got my like little watch watch lists and things like that. Um, and uh, no, I was uh, what I was getting to was I got ahead of the curb on. Um, uh, uh, whose American name is Don Lee, uh, which nerds will know him as uh, 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 Gilgamesh in the Eternals. Cool guys like me will know him uh, as uh, the who, who the character who I call Beef Daddy uh, from Train to Busan, um, and that dude is awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, he is the best. Uh, he he's so great. He's huge. Uh, and and it, it's funny, you know, in the in, in the Eternals, there's a bit where he like slaps a monster to death. That's his gimmick. Like that's his thing. Like he's just this big dude, and and he just slaps the shit out of people. And it's amazing. And so he's got um uh he's got a couple of just fantastic my like, favorite movies of his. Um, uh, one is called uh, Unstoppable. Okay. Where where he plays um, a guy that used to be in the mob, got out. Now he's kind of a down on his luck uh, fishmonger, uh, who's constantly trying to like um, yeah. play the system to to you know, well, yeah try to get try to like make something big, but do it honestly kind of thing. And he's got a long suffering wife who's like, come on, kind of thing. I don't I don't care about any of that stuff. You know, blah blah. blah. She gets kidnapped, and he has to go back to the life that he used to. He has to basically. He is a one-man wrecking ball, going through uh, the Korean underbelly, and it's amazing. Outstanding. Uh, and he That's is great. aided. And he is aided by, uh, if you want, uh, by a private investigator who's played by. If you watched um, Squid Game, the uh, the gangster that was playing the games, that guy uh, who's cool. who's amazing. Who's got an amazing range as an actor as well. Uh, and the other, the other one of his movies that I absolutely love is, um, uh, 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 yes, that's the guy. Um, I is, don't seek uh, everybody is who we're is, talking. I, about. I always thought it was Seok. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, again, I, I don't know. How to say it. Is terrible. I just. I don't know. How to say um, I'd rather I'd rather credit him by his Korean name if you see what I'll, I mean. I'll call, um, I'll call my my good Korean friend Jacob Park. Yeah. And ask him yeah. Exactly. Right um, but anyway, uh, the other movie of his I love is one called uh, The Outlaws, um, okay. which uh, is he plays a cop uh, whose nickname is Beast Cop. Um, but it's set in the eighties and it's a group of, I think it's a, a small group of super violent, um, Hong Kong gangsters come into his jurisdiction, um, and start taking over. And it's just basically it's, it's the police against them. And one of the weird things about like these, these, these Korean movies is like, there's no guns, you know, it's like, so what winds up happening is there are these huge fights, like, 30 on 30 fights with people with like pipes and, and, and aluminum baseball bats and just whatever, just like beating the living shit out of me. Yes. But, but <laughs> at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's like two hours of uh, Mad on Siak just slapping the living fuck out of people. And it's the best. And there's a sequel coming out and I think it's called the rundown or the roundup um, to the outlaws. And, um, I'm trying to, I've, I've been working on the friend of mine that co-owns the, uh, one of the local independent cinemas to program. It. And he's like, I'm looking, I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to get it. Oh, that's Cause great. I cannot, I cannot wait <laughs> to see this thing. You know, I bought, um, I bought VR uh, goggles and every, or a mask, you know, whatever. And I mm -hmm. love watching the uh, Amazon prime on that because you're in a virtual theater. Okay. And it really does feel like you're sitting in a movie theater and there are seats next to you and there's a big screen and it's crazy. Oh, really? Yeah. So honestly, it's like, I mean, I got it to play games and stuff, but I'm like, this is fantastic. And a lot of times I will, I'll just be, you know, all right, fine. Here I am. And it, yeah. it cracks me up. It's, it's outstanding. So yeah, that's a, I treated myself for my birthday last year. I'm like, yeah, you know something I want to get a VR thing. What the hell? <laughs> you know, yeah. but, um, no, I'm so with you, Tom. Absolutely. And, you know, um, do you guys get Turner Classic Movies up there? We do. I don't have it. 
Um, okay. I, th I don't know. The thing is, like, we've got um, our, you know, uh, I don't even know what you call it, our, our stream catcher, whatever it is, like our, our little guy that we access all this stuff with is uh, uh, a, um, it's a fire stick, um, a prime fire stick. So it lists. Sure. Uh, oh, there's Wayne. Yeah. Uh, so it lists a bunch of yeah, different yeah, apps, yeah, okay, but the thing yeah. is, not all of them are actually available in Canada. So you can, okay. you know, you can you can download the app, but you can't actually access anything on it. Um, okay. Because well, month, you know Amazon doesn't give a shit. You know they're gonna they're gonna preload yeah. it with a you know through their sure. thing. So. Well, because um, this month is on on Turner. Uh, every August, they do uh, a star of the month for 24 hours, or star of the day for 24 hours. Okay. And like yesterday was Gene Arthur. And, uh, you know, so a lot of cool, you know, Mr. Smith, obviously, but a lot of other obscure movies. And um, yeah, I love it. I mean, uh, I think August 1st was Elvis. Uh, and that was fun. But uh, yeah, I mean, and again, you and I are mass massive all time movie fans as much yeah. as four. And um, stuff. Yeah, I keep threatening. We showed Graham. Um... Charade, charade, charade. Oh, that's uh, great. Charade. I love um, charade. On, I again, love on charade. Tubi. Uh, it's a fantastic nice. movie. I love it's that in, movie so much. I believe it's in public domain. I think they fucked yeah. up, and it's you know, it's kind of like it's a wonderful life used to. I be. think it's on Prime too. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. No, no, I think every streamer yeah. has it. And I, I mean, my God, it's as others have described it. It's the greatest Hitchcock movie Hitchcock never made. Yeah. It's it's so good. It, yeah. You well know. And it's got everybody in it, and it's so oh, great. I remember the first time grand. I actually. Yeah. First time I actually watched it, I watched it uh, the same afternoon, uh, you know, back back in the there are four channels and what the hell are you going to do with yourself uh, days. Um, uh, I watched it and another movie that I still have no idea what the other movie is. And I think it had Lee Marvin. I think it had George Kennedy. Um, the only scene I remember is it had the same kind of plot like they were they were it was on tvo it was programmed by lb yost that's why they put the two things together because they were okay. similar sure uh, and the only scene i actually remember was something about a micro dot um uh so they were they were driving around in the rain and they had an envelope and again so much of these things, the elements have merged in my head sure. that I've, I don't even know if I'm remembering this properly, right? But they had an envelope that they were, because there's a whole thing in charade with the stamp and you know, right. whatever. Right. Um, but they had, they had this envelope and they put it outside in the rain on the windshield and then this micro dot kind of was activated. Like you, you could see it because it got wet. They brought it in again. That's a micro dot. It means blah, blah, blah. And um like I said, it was like Lee Marvin or somebody like that. No, that's great. No idea. I, I, there's another movie that I watched similarly that uh, all I know is that Gregory Peck and he was on the run and it was some kind of weird um, I know what you're Hitchcocky, about. Hitchcocky science fiction -y thing and he gets to the end of it and there's some like weird um, conspiracy company. You know what I mean? Like every, when you get you get to the end of this thing, there's like a thousand people that work for this, you know, work for the Illuminati somewhere in the middle of the Utah desert. Yes. And 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 they have like a giant room full of uh, people at computer terminals computer. from 1967, yes. uh, uh, all wearing helmets movie? for some reason. But they show him it, it was about some kind of mind control thing, and they show him a cartoon uh, on this big screen to explain what their what their what their evil plot is, but it has somebody designed like a little, I'm Inky Joe. I'm going to tell you how we're going to take everybody's minds over, you know, kind of thing. And like, it, it, I don't remember. Like I have no remember. I have no memory of what well, this movie was, you know, and I I, 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 try as I might, I can't find it. You know? Well, I remember uh, you and I talking about whiskey galore back in the day. Oh yeah. yeah. Still and, my favorite movie. Uh, and uh, it's uh, no uh, Wayne. It's not point blank that um, that uh, Fowler's describing. I know. No, God, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. But um, I and I know I told you this before, and I actually found uh, a remake of Whiskey Galore that Bob Hope of all people made in the '60s, and it's oh. a terrible Bob Hope movie. It's called The Private Navy 
of Sergeant O'Farrell. And it's the plot of Whiskey Galore, but it's Bob Hope and it's Phyllis Diller and Gina Lola Brigida. And um, somebody uh, VCR'd it off of a New York um, local affiliate. And it has local New York commercials in the movie and stuff. And that's what I first saw when you, and when you were describing Whiskey Galore, I'm like, oh, like Bob oh Hope yeah, I back no. in the day. <laughs> Whiskey Galore is infinitely better. But it was so funny to find uh, Sergeant O'Farrell, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's. Well, I mean, it's the same it, thing. It's like now when I tell people about whiskey galore, I always have to kind of, uh, you know, uh, amend it by saying like, don't see the one that was made in two thousand six. I've never seen it. I don't know anything about it. I, it I haven't seen it. Don't either. see it. See this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, it's like to be or not to be. God damn it! I saw. I remember seeing that with my girlfriend when we were still in high school. And it was such a disappointment compared to the original and, uh, you know, with Jack Benny and Carol Lombard and Lubitsch directed it. And it, okay. it was such a, I mean, I love finding these old movies like Whiskey Galore, like To Be or Not To Be, yeah. or Lady, Lady for a Day, the Frank Capra movie that he remade in the early 60s, his pocket full of miracles. And they're these. Oh, really I don't know. I, 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 I wish I like I wish I were more knowledgeable about a lot of this stuff. I'm not. Uh, well, but my point I've, is like I've, I've discovered a, yeah I, smart... I know the stuff I know from those lonely Saturday afternoons oh, you know buddy. What I mean? like I, you yeah know. no we we had the same childhood I mean I just had it yeah. 10 years earlier no you know that yeah. um but yeah no it, I mean that's the great thing and you discover these 30s and 40s movies that are sharp as hell and like yeah. great Preston Sturgis movies or whatever and it's like no they made really smart movies that actually yeah. Hold like up, the pre code I mean, movies and and, and even that's what Lady even, for a Day is. Yes, yeah, even postcode movies where they were still kind of like, eh, you know, the, the right. One of the funniest jokes in Whiskey Galore is uh, a bit where you know, at the very beginning they're talking about the the island uh, being secluded and uh, being a very quiet place and right. whatever. And there's a scene of all these children kind of running out of a house and around the corner. And while the narrator is talking about like, you know, people find ways to pass the time and then just just a, about a dozen children come out of the, which is a, a hilariously subtle sex joke, you know, and it's just, I, but it's just kind of like, good, that's good, that's good, that's good work, you know. No, you know, uh, Sullivan's Travels, the Preston Sturgis movie, uh, Joel McRae is describing what he wants to do and the studio head's like, but yeah, a lot of sex in it. Put a lot of sex in it. And it's like the early 40s. And it's like, yeah, make yeah. sure there's a lot of sex in it. And it's like, that's fantastic. And again, it's like, no, these guys were hip. And it, it is so wonderful. Also, like uh, old old radio uh, comedy, Bob and Ray, uh, two New England, you know, uh, Chris Elliott's dad, uh, Bob Elliott and Ray Goulding. They're these two New England, you know, kind of Pepperidge Farm guys. But they were just doing biting satire radio sketches. And so smart, and literally decades ahead of their time. And yeah, you, I think like, I heard some of that actually. Oh, oh, it's great stuff. And really, you know, a lot. I know a lot of like Penn Jillette's a, a massive Bob and Ray fan. A lot of the SNL writers and, and performers were. And it's like, no, these guys were hip. They kind of knew how to do great comedy and stuff. So no, I, I, yeah. it's it's all. No, I grew up. That I grew up listening to my parents' like uh, comedy albums, um, a lot of which were from the fifties. Sure. Unfortunately, some of them were Bill Cosby records, and those are cursed items in the house. I know, and it's too uh, bad. Because really, he yeah. was a comic genius while being a perv and an asshole. It's yeah, very exactly. Predator. Uh, and and so. and I don't know if you watched that. Uh, um, Kamal Bell. Uh, yeah. The truth uh, that where some Kevin of that actually worked its way into into the jokes at the time you're like oh, God, I yeah i don't i'm there's, never going i can't do it i'm not there's gonna, an album but where, yeah, there's an album where he jokes about uh slipping women mickeys yeah, to make yeah. them unconscious and it's like yeah it's on the yeah, album. it yeah. was there he was yeah. there. he was absolutely telling everybody who he was you know guess what uh, very, do, like, getting away pushing that aside um Indeed. but they had like a bunch of like tony hancock albums and you know so i have I've got friends in Britain that uh, I, I can't do any of the Tony Hancock stuff anymore, but we certainly, you know, talk about like his, his whole deal. Um, and, uh, yeah. you know, there were a lot of like Anna Russell, who was like a funny opera singer. Cool. Uh, this gives you an idea of who my parents were. Um, but uh, Did they have Tom Lehrer albums? They may have. 
Uh, um, I'm not you know, sure. Uh, public television uh, uncovered this great black and white video Tom Lehrer concert that he did in Amsterdam. And his stuff, uh, Poisoning Pigeons in the Park, or the best was he did a, he did a song about Eric Von Braun from the space program who was a Nazi scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got him and, you know, he helped yeah, yeah. elevate the space program. Yeah, I Johnny mean, Paperclip, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, wicked, wicked satire. And mm -hmm. truth, man, and just like you and, and I'm sure your parents and stuff, that 50s era of what they called sick humor, and that's where yeah. Lenny Bruce came from, and that's where Mort Saul came from, and the precursors yeah. of Carlin and Richard Pryor. And it's like, no, that shit's interesting. And I'm always fascinated by that. And when I get the opportunity, um, I don't know if uh, it made it up up by you, but in the 70s and 60s, there was a group, the Fire Sign Theater. And they were very uh, satirical, parodists. And um, I got to interview one of them. There, there's only two guys left. And one of them is this guy, Phil Proctor, who's a voiceover actor, too. And he wrote a couple recent books, and I actually got him on my show. And I'm like, tell me everything. And I <laughs> or even, uh, you know, of course, uh, Canada's own Dave Thomas got to yeah. talk to him about SCTV. And uh, it was the thrill of my yeah, life. I I, I cornered him at a comic con once, and I feel I still feel horrible. Like just the the hot shame of that moment. Um, I did the same thing to Rick Green. I like I just I can't like I just give everybody space now. Now, now um, I run in people in green rooms now, and I'm yes, just like, me too. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to teach you how to use the coffee maker, and we'll talk about our kids, and I will <laughs> see you later. You know. Um, um, Dave Foley was at uh, Terrificon last weekend, and it was great. Yeah, he's going to be at the Ottawa Comic Con. Oh, uh, that's wonderful. Up, so, uh, uh, I will possibly meet him. Uh, I and if I do, I will. <laughs> you, know, you were the prettiest one in a dress. Um, I, you know, I will try not to make a massive ass out of myself. But... Did you watch the new season of this? Oh show? yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, like, I told him, fantastic. and of course that first bit that he does, for people who haven't done, seen it, I won't spoil, but he does yeah. that opening bit with Kevin McDonald with the cops. Yeah. You guys Fearless. The exactly. Fearless. And that's literally, I'm like, and it's so funny, Stephanie Phillips, the comic writer, is watching me do this. I'm like, you guys have balls of steel, and he's laughing. Yeah. I'm like, Siri, and it's literally, I'm like, you guys are fearless. Yeah. And, and well, Stephanie's is, like, I mean, just... well, Stephanie's like, you, you went right there. And I'm like, come yeah. on. I'm like, that's yeah. why they're brilliant. They don't care. Yeah. They well, are the, it's it's the thing that I kind of like about them. What I was so excited about, you know, that that the new series turned out to be good, um, was that it was proof that uh, you you can be a punk and not go off. You know, like they they never lost the path. Your edge, because um, yeah. you know, fucking Johnny Rotten is like trying to get a peerage. Uh, in, the, in, 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 in the UK right now. Like, the, a lot of these people went, like, hard right because, I don't know, people like people were starting to get too nice to each other in the early ups. I have no idea. But they just never, they they didn't lose, the, they, they didn't lose that edge, but they're still just, they just seem to be professional, funny people. Like, they're, they, and they're great for that. Yeah. And the, the show, the show just really, I, I I hope there's a million more new seasons. You know, like everything yes, about it was was just absolutely perfect. When they're um, when they're talking and it's like and then Foley goes, "Am I still the cute one?" No, not really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like yeah, no, everything like all of it was just so great, and and even like getting to the bits where like the um, uh, the you know I've got a pair of roller skates um, <laughs> uh, sketch. Which again, completely fearless because it is a not a funny sketch, you know. <laughs> like, it is, and it is not meant to be. Like it, it's 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 satirical and weird, and it has funny moments to it. But it's like it is it is a thing that is designed to disturb you, yes, uh, in a, yes. in a satirical and funny way. But it is it is there to disturb you, you um, and, and, it's, and it's them. great, you know. And they yes. did uh, they did a lot of that, especially like later later seasons of the original show were just things that were they were just creating things to to provoke provoke us, different yeah. kinds of responses within yep. you know the category of comedy kind of thing. I'm still so with you. And yes. it's just everything is great. And like I that show came on the air at exactly the right time for me. I think I I think it came on when I was in grade nine. Okay. Um, and and I so would... we would we would tape it and watch it 
at school the next day, you know. Oh no, uh, I was and I was just out we, of we'd college. steal the big, you know, the big TV on wheels. The not not the little one on the on the cart, but the big one on wheels that had like doors. I'm we would steal that and we would wheel it into the one of the science rooms where, where the you know the teacher was cool, and we would eat our lunch in there and and well, watch and them. watch that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, man. No, again, I and it's great because I believe I'm like kind of their age. I think they're yeah. all late fifties or early sixties, and you know I'm, I'll be I'm ten years older than you, man. I'll be fifty eight at the end yeah. of the year, but. uh no, I, I, it was so exciting. And me and my uh, roommate were fresh out of college, our first apartment, laughing our asses off at those guys. And yeah, truly, yeah. I mean, I'm quoting him lines. And he's like, oh, I actually wrote that line. I'm like, I know, man. <laughs> I'm like, that's how much I'm into you guys. He was so low. And truly, like you, it's like, all right, I'm going to bug him for like a minute, maybe two minutes. Yeah. Get out of the way. And I don't want, you know, I, especially the yeah. green room. I'm like, I don't look, I know you're back here to chill. But I got to tell you how much I love you. Stuff I can't even do that much because, like, when I when I met Dave Thomas, I was like bringing up Shake and Bake and you know stuff like that. And I just I was like, even while I'm doing it, it's like, I can't stop. I can't. I don't know where I'm. I I need to get away from here because also in those moments, I tend to forget I'm six foot five. Uh, <laughs> I'm in an enormous. I am an enormous human being, and um, there is an implicit threat. Anytime I get within five feet of you, you know, I don't, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if I have a smile on my face or whether or not I have my usual kind of. Why is this resting, giant yelling? At I me? have, well, the thing is like, I have resting rage face. Like people are always kind of like, you I, look so angry when you're walking through that con. I was like, I was just walking. You know, that's <laughs> like, truly that's the expression I make just by living in the world. You know, when I know I'm on camera, that's why I'm always smiling because so many people yeah. told me the same thing. Like, why are you angry? I'm like, I'm not angry. I'm, I'm just yeah. my neutral face. Well, you look so, angry. So I'm like, all right. It, it's, it, 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 it's difficult, you know, because <laughs> you're, you're just, you just want to say how much you love them. But at the right. same time, you're a head and shoulders larger than them. And, and <laughs> just a terrifying human being who's sweating and, <laughs> and, and, and won't shut up. And really? so I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm trying, them, you know. I'm desperately trying not to be that uh, I anymore. And I understand, <laughs> like, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, most people are pretty gracious about that anyway. Like, he was, oh, yeah. he was very gracious. He was very nice. And, um, but it's still, but, it doesn't change. It changes nothing. You know, he wrote, um, he wrote a science fiction comedy novel with um, Max Collins, Max Allen Collins. And, oh, uh, cool. And Dave Hyde uh, was handling PR for them. And he's like, you want to talk to Max? I'm like, yeah, but I also want to talk to Dave. And then he's like, together? I'm like, no. I really want to talk to both yeah. on their on their own because there's so much to talk about with both of them. Yeah. And, and I uh, I talked for, to uh, Thomas for like about just under 90 minutes. And the first 40 minutes, okay, new book, new book. And now I'm like, all right, man, I got to talk to you about SCT. <laughs> I love yeah. it so much. And I also got to meet uh, Harold Ramis. You may have met the Sasquatch years ago. He was at Comic Con, and he <laughs> sweat all over you. He was talking about Shake and Bay. I hear you, man. We talked about uh, when they did the uh, Russian TV parody, Three CP One. Oh God, I love that. Come on, man. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's like he's like, oh, you know, I wrote most of that, and I'm like, well, I know. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. man. I'm like. You don't understand, man. I am like with the microphone. Well, that's the thing. I was so obsessed with I was so obsessed with SCTV um, for a long. Like I was obsessed with it when I was a little kid because I loved it. It's 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 one of those things that works on different levels, right? Like yes. when you're a little kid, you're in it for the funny faces and the fart jokes sure. and you know whatever. <laughs> when you get a little bit older and you have a little bit more cultural reference under your belt, you understand or you know you you understand the the parodies a bit yes. more. And then when yes. you get even older, you have a bit more. Uh, emotional uh, intelligence, you start to really understand everything that was going on and you see all the levels and you're like, Oh God. But um, uh, when I was like most obsessive about it, like in my early twenties or so, I could, I could tell you who wrote which sketch, not because, not because I was reading credits or anything. There was no, this is pre-internet. I, there was nowhere for me to find it. I just knew the voices. A hundred percent. You know, I knew the voices of who, would write what, and uh, so I could always spot a Dave Thomas sketch. I could always spot a Harold Williams sketch. I can't anymore. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, um, no, I'm I'm with. Uh, what was I going to say? That um, oh, um, a friend of mine, Tom Couch, 
was a junior writer uh, with Eddie Gordetsky, who Two and a Half Men, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, tons of okay. TV. But they went to Canada to with Don Novello, Father Sarducci from SNL, to okay. produce later Network 90 SCTV. Okay. And sadly, uh, they didn't mesh because all of the individual SCTV cast members were essentially their own writers and their own producers of each of their sketches. Right. So Novello kind of came in working under Lauren Michaels and very much an SNL kind of like method of, of producing. And they rejected it. And they rejected my buddy who was a junior writer. And mm -hmm. it was a great regret of his. And he's like, no, I totally understood why. But sadly, like Candy even like went off on them and it was really sad and everything. But no, these guys are geniuses and truly with Ramus and with Thomas, it's like you guys made so much out of nothing. Ramus would be like, oh, in, the, in that early half hour days, they'd go to dime stores well before dollar stores, everybody, and buy props and things like that yeah. because they had no budget. Yeah. And, it, and oh different God. and different seasons were produced in different cities just because they could get tax breaks. I can't yes. like they were they started in Toronto, then they went out to uh, Edmonton. Edmonton. Yep. Uh, and then they were yep. you know all over the place. Yeah. Um and um uh what was I um oh and the other thing too is like uh again I think I've mentioned this before. Uh, uh, when you're a kid you start uh you know, at different stages of watching the show, you start to appreciate different cast members oh, uh, yeah. for their contributions on screen um, differently. So, you know, when I was when I was little, it was Martin Short, it was John Candy, it was you know, all oh, the um, guys. yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah, exactly. When I got older, um, it was it was all Joe Flaherty. Love it Joe. Was, Flaherty. It was all uh, uh, Eugene Levy. Sure, uh, it love was, Eugene. It was, Levy. Yeah, right. um, I really at least for the first se at least for the first season, Harold Ramis was amazing. Um, Catherine and, 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 and Dave Thomas and people. Um, but yes. like, I still like the Joe Flaherty stuff that was always like my least favorite when I was a little kid. Just became and that and the Eugene Levy stuff just became like that was the show. You when know, he like did, that uh, was when he did Count Floyd. And they and they yeah. had uh, they had an Ingmar Bergman movie, you know, it was a parody of an Ingmar yeah, yeah, yeah. movie. Yeah, it was called Hour of the Wolf, so it sounds like it's a horror movie. Yeah, but of course, it's just this Bergman movie of just weird angles and shit. And it's yeah, so and great. Then, it's like, all right, kids, it wasn't that scary. And then he breaks character. It's like, <laughs> okay, who does Bergman? these things? Yeah, but also <laughs> the fact that he was also Floyd, the news presenter. Count yes. Floyd was the news Earl presenter. Cameron Baron Floyd and had that uh, horror. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they had uh, 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 they had that whole storyline where he had his battle with the bottle. Um, yes. that he was like at, at at some points he was an alcoholic and then he got better and then he <laughs> relapsed later in the season. And yep. Stuff. Yep. And uh, just again, you know, as a kid, you're like, ah, look at him falling around. But like really seeing, you know, there were real, there was real connective tissue throughout all of that. And I oh, think yeah. that was the same year they did the election stuff as well. Um, and it was uh, Mayor Tommy Shanks and his yes. stuffed dog and just putting the um, the kibble, kibble right on top of that, which I think was supposed to be a, a takeoff of Mackenzie King. Okay. Um, who was our, <laughs> our, our prime minister that talked to his dead mother and had 14, uh, uh, 14 Irish terriers named Pat at different times. <laughs> Um, he named he he had a couple named Doug or something like that, but but he had over the course of however long he had like something like fourteen Irish terriers all named Pat. I wrote a story about it. Oh. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, no, uh, it, 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 all of it was was just incredible, and and you know Guy Calbuyero, of course, uh, in his wheelchair with yelling about respect. respect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the Godfather parody with uh, with Don Gabriel. Yeah, which was about which was about pay TV. It yes, was, uh, when they went to pay TV. Yes, um, that's what all that was. Absolutely. Um, Even the and, Cinemax uh, season that they did is really funny with yeah. uh, Martin Short's older brother Mike. Yeah, uh, and then stuff. Oh no, I'm a. I, I oh, he was a writer. He wasn't on. He wasn't on screen. But... Oh, I thought he was. Um, oh, he was the bartender. Yes, exactly, exactly. He was a bartender yeah. on the um, the the kids show with the alcohol with the alcoholic guy who went on to be on um, uh, 
Schitt's Creek. Oh, he's a okay. mechanic from Schitt's Creek. Okay, he's yeah, a yeah. kind of a uh, he's a Canadian actor. He's an old uh, a bunch of a bunch of stuff. Dude, as um, you know, I mean, truly, I I I'm a massive SCT fan. I love Ken Finkelman and everything he makes. I think he's I like a brilliant some of what satirist. Ken Finkelman makes. I think he can sometimes be a brilliant satirist. Well, you know, when he yeah, steps I, outside I, his when he steps outside his own ass, uh, he can be a brilliant satirist. <laughs> I love him, man. I love more. I mean, tears. he's still, he's still. I've never laughed harder than uh, watching uh, David Cronenberg run down a hallway uh, <laughs> a on one room. of his shows. Yes. So you know, uh, <laughs> but but I think Newsroom was the only thing that really connected me, and and not really? like, and only and only to a point because the last season of Newsroom is unwatchable. That's um, funny. I understand. I, when he I like, starts I, like smoking a cigarette in black and white and being like, ah, I'm going to do, 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 do. I liked more like, tears. I liked more yeah. tears. I thought it was yeah. really funny. You're not uh, Albert Brooks. That's okay. He's good enough. He's Ken Goddamn <clears throat> Finkelman. Don't kid yourself. Yeah. That's hilarious. Did you like Kim's Convenience? Yeah. Uh, I actually too. watched the last season. I loved Kim's Convenience. And it was the so show that I, I kept. Yeah. It was a show I kept recommending uh, people who wouldn't shut up about Shit's Creek. Um, sure. Because uh, it genuinely, it was like, it was that, I think it was the thing that we actually, uh, my wife and I really um, glommed on to after Parks and Rec ended. I like We needed that kind of dose of just nice people being nice. Well, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know? You know, being, um, being Greek and my big fat Greek wedding, it's like, mm, no, man, the immigrant story is universal. Yeah. And oh, no, I, that's yeah. why I love Kim's convenience so much. It's like, yeah, no, I knew so no, many kids. I knew, I like, I grew up with so many kids that were in, um, now most of the kids that I grew up with were Filipino or, or Vietnamese. Okay. Um, but they were, they were going through the same stuff. Like the, it was, uh, you know, cause you have different waves of immigration Certainly. for different, for different horrible reasons. Usual. Usually. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, we oh, were, in a, we were, uh, my, um, my elementary school days were in, well, I mean, all, all my, all the way through high school, I, I was in very, um, uh, very diverse neighborhoods. So, uh, particularly, uh, early in earlier grades and, and, uh, when I was in, uh, intermediate school in grade eight and uh, grade seven, grade eight, um, it was, you know, a, a big influx uh, of people. Yeah, so that's cool. Um, yeah. Dad wants to know if you, uh, watched the good place. Yeah. Loved it. Great show. Absolutely Great. loved it. Tried to get my parents into it, but my my uh, mom just doesn't have a lot of time to watch stuff. So we watched, and it was at a time too where their internet was so crap they couldn't oh. they couldn't really streaming would work for about uh, forty five minutes, then we'd conk out. Um, uh, I she's now um, they've now got significantly better internet, and I got them BritBox. Um, hey, great. And sure. and Netflix and yeah. mom basically bounces through Netflix because uh, my wife Monique got her uh, hooked on a sh a Turkish show um, called High Seas um, that she had watched and actually uh, she'd watch that Monique had watched uh, it, it dubbed, but the dubbing was actually quite good. So she was like, "Yeah, you might enjoy this." Um, and mom liked it, but didn't like that it it continued <laughs> uh she didn't like that there was more than one season um but because she was like oh it's just more you know um <laughs> but now she kind of she just kind of bobs from show to show as netflix kind of presents them to her and she's like oh that seems good because she doesn't know she doesn't care yeah you know? and she's watching she's like oh i'm watching this polish show about this kid that's doing whatever and they're all like international netflix things and, uh, that i have never heard of you know um, but she's really enjoying it. It's really, it's really been a, you know, a help to her. But well, we, the thing is, I got her to watch um, most of the first season of The Good Place, but not enough to get to the twist. Oh, oh. So, <laughs> so, and I don't want to ruin that for anybody. But uh, if, if nobody's actually watched it, but so she's not, she's she does not know what the twist is yet, and she's not aware that there is a twist. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we'll get that. We'll get back to it at some point. I agree with Warren. Um, uh, good place, a great comedy that had the structure of a genre show like Buffy. Great twists. Yeah. Last episode. Yeah. Hundred percent, man. 
It was good long form TV, and it was good. Uh, yes. It was a good essay on what it was, what it was about, you know. And also um, uh, down here, it being an NBC show, they let it be okay. You've got eleven episodes. Fine, make yeah. eleven great episodes, and yeah. we'll see you next year. Well, moreover, they let it end. That's the thing. Like it, it went out at four, at four seasons. Four seasons. Where yeah. normally it would go to five, and you know well, the network was desperate for it to go to five because it was their only hit. You know. Well, yeah, you're right. Their only non serial killer hit. Um, when so. um, I I love the British and original Life on Mars, and um, I loved hearing the commentary and I and their their comparison. I get what they were saying, and they're like, look, the whole premise of Life on Mars is. A cop is in a coma, and in his mind, he's back in 1973. Yeah. Like, we can't quantum leap this for yeah. many seasons. He's in yeah. a coma. If it, if it lasts more than six months of the show's real time, it doesn't make sense. And that's what mm -hmm. I love about British and Canadian TV is it was always like, hey, we got six episodes. Fine. Great. Yeah. Don't stretch it out. Good Lord. All those CW superhero shows – that they have to do 20 plus episodes a season. It's like, mm -hmm. and they, and so many of those middle episodes are spinning their wheels. It's like, this sucks. What are you doing? And so yeah. American TV is reaching that British and Canadian. I have, a, I, have, I have like a third episode rule where like basically every third episode of every TV show I've ever watched has sucked. <laughs> um, and I don't know if it's a scheduling thing. I don't know if they're like, okay, they like the first two, they will. They'll sit Barry. through a third, and then yeah, we can like, the let's put the let's put the dog right there, and uh -huh. then we'll we'll, we'll continue through. Um, but no, I, I going I, to be fair. Canadian TV only has short seasons because we don't have any money. Uh, well, and I realize that I, I'm sure I'm sure the the Canadian networks what there is would love to do much longer uh, things, but I think I, I I think people's tolerance, especially with streaming nowadays. I think people's tolerance has really adjusted to uh, no more than 13 if it's a funny show. And mm -hmm. for the love of God, um, please don't make as many as 10 if it's a, if it's an hour long show. I like those those uh, most most of them. I, I think Marvel is fine. I think and again, I think it's a money. I think it's a contraction of money thing. But um, the fact that the new Marvel shows don't last much longer than six episodes is fine. Right, that it's fine because those yeah. Netflix things were way too long. I'm with you, and they did not that. have the story to cover them. You know, no, you're right. And good lord, I, again, I don't want to because I've been bothering my guests with new Star Trek talk, and that's exactly the problem with new Star Trek. They have four or six hour ideas that they spread over ten or even fifteen episodes. Yeah, it's like fuck you. It's sagging in the middle. Get to the point and get out. Yeah, we've we've noped out of most of the star trek stuff um that's come down like we watched most of discovery i don't think i don't know what season it's on now we 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 got to a point where i just got tired of it it's horrible um and it was uh, i mean we got to the way in the future yeah stuff, that was where the they started season. doing stuff and i was actually really enjoying it and then i then i just i was like i you know I, it was the first time i was really enjoying it for a while because it felt new and they were doing episode by episode stuff and yeah. there was a longer thing, but I, it just didn't, I don't know. It wasn't, it wasn't, it just, it just, it stopped doing it for me and they could not divorce themselves from that mirror, mirror crap. And I'm so it's, it's, it's like the thing I hate the most about Star Trek is mirror, mirror. <laughs> um, I understand you're not alone. And, and, and we watched the first season of Picard and I was like, yeah, well, whatever, you know, that's, well, that's fine. I will say that and we know we, I got I got halfway through the second season. I was like, I'm out. I can't. Oh no, I, Picard like, is. Although I hear people who have already seen season three, and it's a next gen reunion, and it's uh, they're saying it's so much better. So yeah, I have I hope. Do. But uh, the Christopher Pike show, Strange New Worlds, is pretty. I'm good. really really enjoying it. The hey. thing that always kills me, and this is this this is me taking a stab at Trek fans. Um, the thing that always kills me about Trek shows is every time a new one comes out, there's like two, three episodes where a bunch of people were like, this is real Trek. This is Trek. This is the way it's supposed to be. And then they get very quiet. Yeah. That's <laughs> what happened. Apparently, because, and the thing, the reason they get quiet is because it is real Trek. It's boring and preachy. 
Um, sorry. No, um, no, it's good. So, no, but no uh, the, the the bits of the bits of of uh, <laughs> Strange New Worlds that we've watched have been fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. We've only gotten as far as the first mention of the Gorn. Yes. Um. So we haven't actually seen them yet. Okay. Uh, I gather. I gather we do, but it was just we see the spaceship and we see the the the, the evidence. Uh. Yeah. yeah the blood. Um. Yeah. And uh. And the the security officer losing her mind a little bit about it. Um. Yeah. So we see we we watched up to that point, and I'm I'm really enjoying all of it. Um, I gave it a B minus. And I I got I got into a thing I got into a thing with Kevin Church on Twitter. Because I was like, Did, isn't there like a Gorn on the on Discovery? And he was like, that's a Saurian, actually. And we did. And I was like, well, I mean, how much of that is just them retro saying like, let's you do a Gorn and just retrofitting it? And he's like, well, I think you'll find that they were in the first movie and yeah, mm, yeah kind of stuff. <laughs> and oh no, we just started making, we just started doing jokes. We just started doing jokes about. Um, uh, Gorn pretending to be a Saurian, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, and just starting to eat people slowly. Um, yes. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the one that I actually that I responded to more than any of the others is uh, Lower Decks. Lower I Decks. Love Lower Decks. I it's everything. It's everything I wanted Star Trek to be forever. It's better science fiction. It's shorter, so there's less there's less yeah. fat to yep. trim. Yep. Um, there is an arc that goes through seasons, but it's more of an emotional arc, and it's and, episodic. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and and it's and it's episodic, but it's just really well written. It's really funny. It's the best Trek I've seen since Justin Lin, and I I just like the up to this point, yeah. the only Trek I ever liked was Justin Lin Trek, Star Trek um, Beyond. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. Which bums me out to watch because I can't watch Anton Yelchin anymore because it just it makes me sad. sad you know. 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 Um. And it's just like everybody got something to do. They all got something to do, and they were so great. <laughs> and that's the problem with <laughs> you know, yeah. They, you know, Michael Burnham does everything, and yeah. when she's not on camera, everybody talks about Michael Burnham. And yeah. it's like, uh, you're doing it wrong. I don't know how to yeah. break kids, but you're doing it wrong. Well, anyway. Well, I mean, having said that, that's that that was Kirk. No, I that's mean, you're describing Kirk. the original series. I mean, the, but it, it was, can, always, but it was Tom, always Kirk. That was the '60s. Yeah, I know. And they kind of learned <laughs> in, in the 80s with the Patrick Stewart show where Michael Pillar is the guy who said, we've got a crew as opposed to the problem of the week, the planner of the week. We can still do that, but let's make a Wharf show. Let's make a Data show. Let's make a Troy show, yeah. a Crusher show. And they and they threw all that out. And it's like, no, Michael Burnham, Michael Burnham. She's the solution to everything. She's the smartest person in the room. And it's like, this sucks. But anyway, <laughs> I want to, again, we've spent more of the time on Trek than I want. No, that's fine. But, uh, Dude, it's uh, it's after eleven your time. I mean, I you know I love talking to you and everything, but uh, I'm good. I'm up. fine. All right. Well, regardless, I mean, you know, we, we I got nowhere it. to be. I got nowhere to go. Officer and gentleman, absolutely. I got a painting. Uh, I got to finish. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Um, uh, again, remind me uh, the Joe Hill uh, line uh, title. Uh, yeah, it's it's Hill House Comics. Uh, it is the sequel to Basket Full of Co uh, Basket Full of Heads. It is called Refrigerator Full of Heads. Uh, FOC is the 21st uh, okay. for most comic book stores. Uh, but depending on your distributor, that might be the 19th or the 8th. Um, okay. so, or depending on their distributor. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, hardcover um, looks, uh, everything I've seen with it looks really good. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. I want a lot of them to sell because I want the royalties. Oh, I'm with you, man. God bless you. Because I need the royalties. I totally um, agree. Because I just picked up my car from the garage today, and it was $2,600. I saw your tweet, buddy. I know. I, yeah. believe I sympathize. Yeah. I so sympathize. Um, so, yeah. So And then announcements coming in the fall, and we'll do a new talk in the yeah. fall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and then after that, I'm talking about other things with other people. Um, so Beautiful. we're – where and hopefully um, shorter. I, what I'm, what I would like to do, if I can lay out a plan, is that I am going to dust off my Patreon at some point, and I am going to start doing my own comics, largely silent comics, on it. Great. Um, if if I can, 
Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm trying not to put too much pressure on myself, but I have, sure, you know, I have things that are ready to go that I can, that I can probably manage to, uh, manage to knock out. And beyond that, um, hopefully, uh, it's refrigerator, a gra- full graphic novel, or it was serialized in floppies. Um, we're talking about the hardcover, uh, uh, collection. Yeah. Um, right. But uh, back to, uh, yeah, back to silent. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So largely silent. I have just mostly visual storytelling. I mean, it's cool. not, I'm not putting any limits on it. Um, and then hopefully some kind of shorter form graphic novels. Um, I don't, I don't know that I'm going to be doing much in terms of monthly comics moving forward. It's just it's too much of a grind for me now. Um, but, uh, I mean, uh, never say never. I mean, if the right okay. thing comes along, then, you know, great. Sure. And I certainly don't want editors to say like, oh, well, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm going to call yeah. them. You know, yeah. Um, sure. but most of the things that I've been looking at doing are, you know, uh, in the range of 48 to 88 pages kind of things. So that's great. Mm-hmm. Tom. Absolutely, man. Stanley was asking, will I have any shows coming from C2E2? I'm pre, I'll be recording the two panels that I'm doing at C2E2, Stanley. Um, Friday, I'm doing the Sven Gulli panel with Rich Coes, and I'm always honored that Rich asks me to come back and moderate his panel. That's always a blast. And on Sunday, uh, me, Art and Franco from Tiny Titans, our friend Scott McMahon, who's a great little cartoonist, and our friend Mike Camperboso, who's a very funny guy. We do the Oh Yeah podcast. It's on the Word Balloon feed, and we'll do a, a, a show at C2E2 that we will present as well. So two pre-recorded shows coming from C2E2. And in addition, I still have uh, six panels to release from uh, last week's Terrificon. Great, great conversations with uh, some of your favorite creatives. So there you go. There's my plug. So uh, there you go. Uh, but yeah, Fowler, as always. Great and, I, and I will be at the Ottawa Comic Con, and that's the only one. I might, I might be in Albany uh, at the next one. I don't know, but it, it basically a con has to be within a five hour driving range of me. I am not getting on a fucking airplane again. I don't think ever at this stage. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so if there's a con out there that's within five hours of Ottawa, I don't care what side of the border it is. If I can drive there and everybody's wearing a mask. <laughs> well, hopefully, eventually, I may be there. To, yeah, I'll make it up to Fan Expo or something like that. Well, to, I won't uh, be there. Well, okay, is that one of the five hours? <laughs> not yeah. not counting Toronto. Well, that's what I mean. Uh, I'm not yeah, because sure. um, yeah, I I mean no, and I and you know you and Wayne in Ottawa and everything. I got to go visit you guys at some point. Yeah, when well, things calm down. Sure. But absolutely, no, man, this is great, and thank God for video because I miss you, and I'm glad you're yeah. doing better. And, I'm happy, uh, and I'm glad. I, I'm glad I've actually been able to figure. Like being a tech, technophobe, I'm glad I've actually been able to figure this part of things out. Absolutely, um, man. Yeah, so, yeah. No, so hopefully, more conversations at some point. Indeed, indeed. All right. Everybody, thanks a lot for watching. This will do it for video this week because I got to prep for C two E two, and uh, but I still, like I said, I got a lot of. Pa- I got a lot of. I, all of a sudden, I sound like Trump. A lot of panels. A lot of people talking about what I did at Terrific on. Uh, you'll hear all those. Eventually, I'll have the videos for those as well and C2E2. And uh, we'll come back to a video next week post C2E2. you got to give me a, a day or two to recoup from uh, the madness for four days. But it's going to be a lot of fun. And it all starts tomorrow, even uh, pre-convention. Uh, so thanks for watching. Everybody stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy.